Getting platinum trophies is something I like doing to pass the time and sometimes just to relax, get more out of a game, didn't have any goals with it, it was just a hobby. I don't remember my very first platinum on my first account because I forgot what my password was and sort of gave up on it and so I created another account but then I also forgot about that second account so now I'm on my third account and this is where I decided to go for 100 platinum trophies before 2023 ends as a milestone even though I didn't decide on that until very later on. Also a lot of these games I haven't thought about since earning their platinum trophies so I might forget some things about certain games. Batman Arkham Asylum will be my first platinum. I already got this platinum on other accounts, so this was mostly a walk down memory lane. The hardest trophies are 100%ing combat and predator challenges. I've always had a hard time with the predator challenges because of combat I could control the outcome of my results by not getting hit a single time for all of them. And as long as I follow that rule, then I got the highest score. Some of the predator challenges are so specific with its requirements in the extreme versions that early on I looked up a video guide on it because I was not about to spend hours in an entire day on one move I had to do on a specific henchman within a specific time frame. It was a matter of trial and error and I eventually got all the requirements on all the maps. Now madness takes you forever. The Riddler and his riddles and trophies. Now is it annoying that I had to go find every single riddle and trophy throughout the asylum? Yeah it was, but since I played this game a bunch as a kid, most of them I was able to find again and while it does feel useless to get them, it's sort of worth it when you get the message of Riddler getting arrested. At least there's something aside from getting the trophies that you get from collecting all of them. Once again! I have defeated you, Batman! There are two missable trophies, which most of the time I don't like because it means having to replay the game another time. Some games I do want to play, but others, for various reasons, I might not want to go through again. These two aren't that bad. Saving every person in the gas room, which should naturally happen. A guard or henchman will call for help whenever you pass them. And knocking out every single person at the party should happen if you just want to knock out people. Detective mode should always be on because there's no reason not to use it. It helps detect which guards have a gun or not. You can see we walls and Riddler trophies from a far distance. It just helps with the game overall. Tick -tock. The story for Arkham Asylum is simple. The Joker is purposely caught by Batman to get into Arkham Asylum and does what he does best, which is create chaos and let out inmates and force Batman to put them back in their cages along with some notable faces. Scarecrow has the best fights even though it really isn't a fight. I had to go to the spotlight and shine it onto Scarecrow but being stuck in his dreamlike world and not getting seen by him was still really cool. A lot of the other boss fights play out the same which involves the battering. Throwing a battering at Bane just before he charges, the Titan battles work out the same way, throwing it at poison ivy so that her shield can be opened up and throwing it at killer crack at his neck to trigger electricity to make him go back in the water. These aren't bad but it gets repetitive. The battering is the only gadget during combat that can be useful. The sonic battering is only useful for predator situations. Same thing for the explosive gel and bat claw. I always forget that the bat claw and freeze grenades during combat aren't available until Arkham City. So while the combat still feels good, it gets expanded upon in later games. You'll never beat me, Joker. I won't let you win. And then the Joker is great, especially when it's voiced by Mark Hamill. Joker is just having a lot of fun and during his fight takes time to embellish in the moment and wave high at the helicopter at certain point, which would be his downfall. And the ending is where, depending on what you do, can have either Scarecrow, Killer Croc, or Bane come up and touch the Titan box as the post credit scene. I forgot a wire how one pops up, but I still don't know what this meant. Based on future games, it seems that Scarecrow is the one that's canon or maybe Rocks they have plans for this scene to be important in the next game, but plans change at the last minute. I still love this game it still holds up and there are certain places where mobility feels limited but obviously it will get better in the next game aren't you supposed to be up on your feet and trying to stop me Batman Arkham City came out two years later and it made everything better. There was a slide button so that I can slide into grates rather than pressing to open it. Gliding was made better with diving down and then pulling back up for more gliding distance. Side missions were added so that it wasn't just the Riddler stuff. New faces, both villains and allies were present. 
So once again, the hardest trophies were the challenges now in the form of Riddler's Revenge. And since I played the Return to Arkham version, it came with all the DLCs, which most were a part of Riddler's Revenge, specifically Catwoman and Nightwing. Some of their Predator challenges were not fun to go through. Both played differently from Batman. Catwoman is a lot faster and sort of allows for some mistakes every now and then. But what's not great is for some reason, silent takedown animations seem to take longer for her. And so many of my fails came from this and I would either die or just restart from frustrations and she doesn't have a glide so I couldn't conveniently land right next to a guy that I wanted to take out take the long route to take out the rest of the henchmen whenever I fulfilled all the requirements for Nightwing, it's also gliding. He has no cape like Batman and Robin, and his forward jump is a long jump. And so I had to figure out the timing on that, as well as figure out how to use his gadgets, as all playable characters have different gadgets. Police Brutality Extreme for most of the characters had one hard requirement. And like with the first game, I will give it a try, but after a certain point, it's time to look up a video guide. And then Top of the World Extreme for Nightwing was hell. Because of the triple headshot requirement, using the wrist dart and getting one hit takedowns didn't go according to plan because sometimes Times, when I was clearly aiming for the head, it would somehow miss and I would have to restart over and over again until eventually I got it. And so you would think it would be over and the rest of the game would be fun and easy. But no, it didn't get any easier because of the campaign challenges, which were combining three maps and I had to complete all of them with the requirements in a row with modifiers that I hadn't used or else the game would choose one for me. And you know, a good amount of them were easy. But once again, the extreme versions with some good but also bad modifiers added to their frustration. And restarting also sort of sucks because if I had already cleared the first two maps and then the last one gave me the most trouble, I would then have to restart. But then then restarting would mean restarting the entire challenge from the first map just to get to the last map which is the only one that was giving me trouble. So anyone going for this platinum, good luck. Hopefully you don't try to smash your controller because some of these challenges will have you thinking that Robin was a lot easier to play because it's like Batman but with different gadgets and Batman was obviously easier because I've played with him the most. There are side missions now and a lot of them allow for some of Batman's rogue gallery to pop up. The Arkham Assaults were fine, there were random acts of violence and will pop up after certain events. The ER training at first was difficult especially the later ones but having played this a lot this wasn't too hard and you get the grapple boost which helps and makes gliding even better but the actual mission itself is fine. Get me out of here. It's that kind of attitude that gets you in these kind of situations. If you don't open this door. I'll kill you. Bane's side mission I thought was going to lead into something good in the end. After destroying the titans around Arkham City, it turns out Bane had plans of keeping the rest of the titans to himself and wants to crush Batman. But he locks Bane in the cell, which I think is ridiculous because you're trying to tell me that Bane just can't crush through that cell and come on out. Hello, Batman. Do you recognize my voice? Victor Zaz. In the flesh. Victor Zaz is the cold call killer and this one gets repetitive with having to trace his calls whenever you pick up. The only good thing I guess is hearing him tell stories about his first kill, why he continued to kill, and his first meeting with the penguin. Aside from this, it was easy knocking him out without getting caught. There are two missions that require finding a gadget. The freeze grenade or clustered freeze grenade is found only because of Harley's loose lips. And going back to the iceberg lounge to get the remote gadget. These were I guess not useless because you get to have some gadgets but it could have been used for something else. Finding Noir Freeze was relatively easy as long as you had detective mode on and listen in on comms and find a giant weak wall that can be broken near the cranes and then report back to Mr. Freeze. Real simple. This is the journal of Dr. Thomas Elliot. The identity theft story is interesting throughout the entire time because someone is killing people and wrapping their faces with a bunch of bandages and the further you go on it seems that Bruce Wayne is the killer but that's not possible. It turns out to be Bruce Wayne but it's actually Thomas Elliot, a former childhood friend of Bruce and wants to drag his name and reputation down. I like this because of Elliot's commitment. What better way to ruin someone by actually being them? He gets away but one day Batman will get to him. Bruce Wayne. Deadshot is going around and killing people on his list and Batman not only has to track him but find the list of people that he had been hired to kill. Love that you already meet him at the start when he teases Bruce already being on his list. A lot of it is scanning and seeing where his bullet ricocheted off a building or something like that. In order to hit his target I was able to prevent Jack Ryder from dying and his fight isn't really a fight because he one shots you if he sees you. So it was sort of disappointing but the journey to getting here was good and he was pissed off that he missed that shot so I'm willing to let this one slide. 
more tea, Batman. The Mad Hatter was a lot of fun. There's a cure for Batman and it turns out to be the Mad Hatter and puts you in his world and you're stuck in a different plane of existence and have to fight through multiple henchmen until Jarvis pops up and eventually knocks him out with his hat. It's a short one but Jarvis messing with you for a bit was just enough. It didn't have to be super long or have multiple investigations. Kind of already know that Jarvis is up to no good. I've been watching you, Batman, to see if you are ready. Azriel is the watcher and he shows up after story events. He talks and then leaves behind a symbol. After scanning four symbols, it leads to the church and explains that he's part of a group that's been watching Batman and is seeing if he's ready for whatever they have plans for him. It remains a mystery even through finding the truth, so it fits the mission, but it's also not the most exciting or interesting side story, but I am intrigued on what's going on. Could it be that while you were out doing what you do, I, the Riddler, snuck in and took all those poor stupid fools? And then the last one is the Riddler and is clearly the best one. He has kidnapped people from the church and there's now an incentive to collect and solve riddles because he doesn't reveal where the next hostage is until a certain amount is collected. And then when you're done with the last hostage, he doesn't have any more secrets to reveal which means collecting every single riddle and trophy which doesn't include the Catwoman trophies. You can't pick them up, only Catwoman can. But after all is collected, his hideout is near the museum and you gotta take him down under the wooden floor. A lot was put into this one and gave me a reason to collect every Everything. It's Batman! What the hell? Sorry to disappoint you boys. Catwoman is a playable character throughout the story and they're not anything too important aside from one major decision so it's not really needed but it is a nice break from the bat. She opens up the game trying to steal from Two-Face and after the prologue stuff Batman meets them and takes care of Two-Face. Catwoman then wants to steal from Hugo Strange but needs help from Poison Ivy and it doesn't go according to plan because Ivy hasn't forgotten about what Catwoman has done but she's willing to forgive her unless she saves her plant. During the vault section I chose to destroy the plant because Catwoman seems like the type of person to just completely clap back at someone who just tried to kill or threaten to kill her. She's then given another choice to either leave or help Batman who's stuck under a bunch of rubble. Leaving him will end the game which is a nice surprise. I remember seeing this on a YouTube video and was shocked that the game could even end at this point. I chose to save him because there was more to do and then her last part comes after the ending of the main game where she wants to leave but Two-Face wants his revenge and so she goes to knock him out one more time and this one felt the most useless. It was just sort of there and did nothing for me and sort of wish that this would have been more of a thing in future games but with a lot more time put into it. I guess the closest thing to this would be the dual tag team stuff in Arkham Knight. I feel I should thank you. Capturing Bruce Wayne is so much easier than Batman. The story this time around is that Hugo Strange knows Batman's identity and plans on releasing Protocol 10. I like Strange as sort of the main villain because he seems to be steps ahead of Batman and uses his secret to force him to search for answers when Strange has no real intention of revealing the secret. This game has some really good boss fights. Fighting Solomon Grundy at the museum was really cool because after uppercutting the penguin, there was nothing left to do, right? But then he just surprises you with Grundy at the end. Mr. Freeze has the best one depending on which difficulty you play on. It will decide on how many moves and gadgets you will have to use to defeat him and after one use, Freeze will freeze that method which forces me to use another one that I probably wouldn't have used unless it's this fight. The reason for the fight happening is sort of stupid. Freeze destroys the other cure just because but this fight makes up for it I guess. Ra's al Ghul's fight was also really cool having a drink from the chalice to keep Batman alive for a couple of hours and then gliding into the hole to fight. The different stages with the multiple versions of him to counter and Having a head start with combos, the big version where he throws ninja stars and a sword was good and then the constant counterparts were pressing counter to block his attacks. All of it was really good. Joker is of course in this game and wants Batman to look and make a cure for him. The time within Joker turned into a curse and needs a cure. So he puts his blood within Batman so that he needs to look for a cure. Both are on borrowed time and Batman progressively gets worse until drinking from the chalice. Ask Mr. Freeze for a cure, destroys one and leaves one for Joker to steal. Joker throughout the game seems to look like crap but then at certain points look healthy and the reason for this is because of Clayface. He also has a good fight as well, throwing a bunch of freeze grenades to freeze him and then go inside of him and come back out to get the cure. Batman drinks the cure and was willing to give some to Joker because after everything that has happened, he still would have saved the Joker. Because they sort of need each other, Bruce needs a reason to constantly go out as Batman and the Joker needs someone to play with. Joker stabs his shoulder and drops the cure, leaving himself to die. And so while the Joker won't be around anymore to create headaches for Batman, there's a part of him where he feels that he failed because the one rule is to never kill and save everyone. And in this moment, Batman has failed. Killing the Joker off was a bold choice. 
The only question is where does the game go from here if Joker is the most well-known villain who can fill in the shoes and match the Joker. And lastly, the Harley Quinn DLC has some trophies. There's collectibles to destroy and collect. This takes place after the game and Batman has gone missing because of Harley. And Harley just wants revenge. Robin's fun to play mainly because of a shield bash. She blames Batman for letting Mr. J to die. And even in this DLC, you can tell the death of the Joker heavily affects Batman. He can't let go of letting a person die even if it was a villain. Resident Evil 5 is a childhood game. I played it a lot growing up. I remember going to Best Buy with my dad and pleading that I really wanted this game. And eventually after some, you know, asking, looking at the price and whatnot, maybe some pleading, he eventually got it for me. And it's a really fun game. It goes away from the horror aspects of the franchise. Co-op especially is really fun. Have a friend over, whether it's online or co-op, it's a really great and fun time just to mess around. There's collectibles and treasures you have to collect to sell for money emblems and points and whatnot this game came out before the base game separated and then all the dlcs afterwards and so i thought i couldn't get this platinum because all the trophies were all in one but i don't need to get the other dlc trophies at all which is nice but i did still get all the dlc trophies for desperate escape and lost of nightmares because they were dlc story trophies desperate escape is pretty much catching up with josh and joe and how they caught up with chris and sheva it's not really that hard even on professional i did it alone and it was like relatively fine as long as you were going most of the time then I was fine. The story itself didn't do much for me at all. Lost in Nightmares, on the other hand, is really fun. You play as Chris and Jill, and you go inside a very familiar-looking mansion from the first RE game, and you have to find Wesker because he's somehow back. And this is essentially you going through the entire mansion, going to this underground thing, and killing these monsters with eyes in their back, and then leading into that Wesker fight that we all saw during the flashback. Love that once you were underground, you lost everything. There was no healing, no guns. You had to use flashbangs and use cranks to pull up the spikes and push it down on the monsters. And then the Wesker fight is just surviving. There's a trophy tied to like beating him, quote unquote, I think. But after that, it plays that same cutscene that you see from chapter 3. Welcome to Africa. My name is Sheva Alama. Chris Redfield. Is back and he has even bigger arms. Everyone knows about the volcano part, the big ass boulder. Punching the hell out of that thing and somehow pushes it to save Sheva and cross by. He's a part of the BSAA and he's on a mission, just a normal mission. But then realizes that people are infected and all of it leads to Excella and then Wesker. And then finding out that Joe's alive because he thinks that Jill is completely dead. So once he finds out that Wesker is involved, he vows to kill him forever. Sheva is his new partner and she's alright. She's not really a memorable character. The only thing I remember was her parallel to Jill. Once Chris saw her trying to like kill herself and Wesker. Her. Even though he doesn't really know her that well, he is still willing to save her and doesn't want to repeat the same thing that happened to Jill. Wesker is great. He's a very cheesy, over the top villain. His motives are, I think, destroying the world or something like that. Honestly, I don't care because Wesker himself is great. And then Jill is just kind of weird in this one. Wesker didn't kill her, surprisingly. He saved her and turned her into his killing machine. And she's now like this assassin in a battle suit. It's just sort of a weird kind of way to take her character. Whenever I think of Jill Valentine, I think of Ari 1 and RE3 not this battle suit version and then the volcano fight so funny thing I never get to his last state or last stage fight because there's a really quick and easy way to get rid of him especially on professional difficulty I get infinite rocket launchers that's the first thing I unlock because it makes pretty much everything so much better you don't have to worry about Sheva at all getting hurt and once you get at the volcano fight aim your rocket launcher at Wesker's back and then the fight's over you can skip Sheva falling in the volcano or punching that boulder and Wesker's final stage State, you could skip all of that. Platinum 4 and 5 were Arkham Asylum and City again because I still have my PS3 copies and since they were still fresh in my mind I did them once again. Arkham City was a lot easier because I didn't have to do the DLC.
Assassin's Creed 2 was my first Assassin's Creed game and this game is still really good. The only issue I have with it is the controls. There are certain missions or just certain things like parkour and the racing missions. They were frustrating because sometimes maybe it was just me but I would not get to my destination because of a certain building or certain person and just certain ledges that I wouldn't be able to get up or something like that. And so the controls and movement and mobility feels not that great anymore but everything else about the game is still good. Ezio is a really good character seeing him grow up from being this kid picking fights with another person and then seeing some of his family members get killed only having Claudia and his mom and then being forced into being an assassin and then finding out that his father and his uncle and other assassins were assassins and now he's involved with Templars now. Mario is the most well-known assassin because of his name and not to Super Mario. He now has to act sort of like the surrogate father to Ezio since losing his father. Ezio wants revenge but Mario and the other assassins want him to temper his you know revenge because they don't want him going way too far that he's too far gone from losing his humanity. There are a lot of collectibles the only annoying ones are the feathers because they're not visible on the map which is one thing I don't like. If I have to collect collectibles there better be some kind of icon or something I can buy to show icons because I don't want to have to look up like a guide. The present day stuff with Desmond I've never cared for at all. Seeing your own history through your ancestors a really cool idea but how about just spend less time with the present day stuff and the more the franchise goes on the more I start to care less about the present day stuff especially when Desmond's killed off. It's a very easy platinum to get. It's not very demanding. There's no online trophies or something like that. It's just do everything. All right, I'm ready. So I have still to this day have not seen the Back to the Future movie or the other movies. It's not like I don't want to but I just I can't really find that time. Watching movies is just kind of put on the back burner for me. This game is I'm sure non-canon because I think Edna doesn't exist in the movies. I can be completely wrong on this because there's time travel stuff involved. There's time travel shenanigans going back in the 30s to say Doc because Marty sees the DeLorean come in and Einstein the dog pops up. Find out he's been arrested and blamed for a murder and you gotta help that out. But once again time travel rules always bend and most of the time don't make any sense but it makes for a very fun concept and so Marty goes back again trying not to see himself or else it would create even more issues and then somehow doing all of this Doc and Edna get together in a future that has very good citizens but also people always wanting to break rules because they're so strict and then Edna turned out to be pretty much crazy because she burned down the speakeasies because the police weren't doing anything and they were corrupt contrast that to the 80s where she's an old lady and she's pretty much all alone yelling at hooligans blaming everyone for issues around the neighborhood and so after everything seems to be good guess what another DeLorean pops up and it's an older Marty from like another feature universe or whatever it is and then another one pops up and so once again time travel rules they always somehow come back and they break and they bend the rules and so Doc and Marty they have to go back in time once again it's a fun time travel narrative game there is one trophy that's hard and it's during help a younger version of Doc mix a bunch of ingredients that part was really hard and I pretty much looked up a guide it's only helpful to an extent because it is completely random and RNG on the things that you have to do and the only reason I got this game was because of Telltale games I have completely forgotten about Prototype 2. Don't remember this. What's the plot of this game? I don't know. I think you play as Heller or James Heller, who's a forgettable kind of cookie cutter protagonist. I think he was forced into this situation by Alex Mercer, who was the first protagonist from the first game, which I haven't played yet. And so maybe because I just didn't play the first, I don't have context on who Alex is. Was he actually evil in the first game or was he in the same situation like James? I'm not sure. It is fun to play though. I do remember that. Uh, but since it's an open world game collect a lot of things and then yeah I don't know like murder your maker is a cool idea but because I don't have context it's just another bad guy who turned you and then you had to kill him I think you get people's memories by consuming them you have like hammer fist a blade a whip fist or something like that yeah I don't know I forgot I at least have the platinum so there's that I got the Ezio collection on PS4 until I once again platinum Assassin's Creed 2 for number 9 
can was brotherhood and i love that it's all one map because i don't have to like go into a loading screen i can just be in one map in one area one big giant map this is so far the hardest assassin's creed of platinum because you have to 100 sync everything the mainline sequences and the side missions there's special requirements and I thought, okay i don't have to do that but no there's a trophy for like doing everything and that made getting this platinum a lot more frustrating than the second game and the others as well and on top of that the da vinci missions were added on because they were originally dlc and are now required for the platinum and for some reason these were a lot harder desmond kills lucy in the present because of the apple of eden which is being controlled by one of the people from the first civilization which anytime these people pop up i check out because this isn't really needed once again assassin stuff in the past that's all really cool present day desmond lucy who i don't care about their relationship i think she turned out to be like a templar or something like that and then to add on to like these people and ancestors that left the apple of eden and just all the other edens both templars and assassins want it templars want it for power and control while the assassins want it for freedom and liberation i think for me it's just kind of there and then the story as well is pretty much revenge again the pope's son which i forgot to mention the final boss fight in the second game is a hand-to-hand -hand combat fight he failed and Ezio let him live his son is now the main villain who just isn't the most compelling villain because he's a whiny villain which he's supposed to be but i don't like that at all and so he just was not a threat he was pretty much a spoiled brat that wants power and control and he's the one that gets mario killed he was a fan favorite so that means he has to die for some reason incest involved with him and his sister okay sure that's gross the only things that i did like in this game was the map clouda becoming an assassin because rather than spending time selling jobs or doing whatever she was doing why not have her join the assassin she'll be more useful as an assassin and etsu having his own assassin group that was all really cool And then in Revelations, Ezio is an old ass man now. He is way past his prime of trying to climb up buildings and being an assassin. He's not looking for revenge or trying to recruit any more assassins. He wants to look for Altair because he might have another piece of the Eden. And so of course, when he goes on his travels, it doesn't go as planned. He meets other Templars who want him dead because he's a well-known name by this point. He meets other assassins that look up to him. And so Ezio just kind of feels like he's in the middle of Templar and assassin thing that's going on, which I do like, but it's it's also not the most interesting thing sort of like bored or just kind of checked out throughout most of the cutscenes he eventually finds Altair in his body that's been rotting all these years and finds the eating but then realizes that these Edens are pretty much a curse to anyone that touches it because we get flashbacks to Altair and how this pretty much splits apart anyone it's very OP and no one should have that kind of power which is why Ezio leaves it alone now he can just move on this was a cool way of like bridging that gap between the first game and all these Ezio games it's impossible for them to meet each other and so this is a really cool way of doing it and Ezio acknowledging Desmond was also another really cool moment but in terms of the Edens being bad it was like well yeah flashbacks in this game just showing people wanting more and more power even though they don't really need it Desmond after killing Lucy is confronted by subject 16 who just tells him they're in a different plane of existence or something like that he has to get out 16 just sort of talks and talks and then speaking of of subject 16 the dlc trophies were a platformer it's sort of weird i mean i do appreciate the difference but it just sort of turned into like portal 2 or something like that trying to get past all like these hurdles and obstacles and then the one trophy i want to bring up is tax evasion now i thought my game was glitched because i cannot get this goddamn person or guy to just pop up i was watching videos of people staying in a haystack and then he'll eventually come but then he never came and what's more annoying is that i saw this guy earlier in the game like very early on but then i did nothing because i was too busy getting all the collectibles and so that was the most annoying part knowing that i could have gotten this trophy but then by some goddamn miracle the rng gods were on my side and he popped up on the map i tackled them and got my money back this one is like either glitched bugged or maybe there's a certain point in the game you have to do it and then the rpg thing i didn't mind that that was fine i get why most people didn't like it this is an assassin's creed game you want to do you know assassin stuff and go kill people and go assassinate them not play this minigame the next three 
three Platinums were from the same series and a part of a collection, the Nathan Drake collection, the first three games remastered with new things and better graphics, all follow kind of the same path to getting the Platinums, which is completing the game on crushing difficulty, getting all the treasures, which by this point, I'm not gonna lie, getting collectibles, not a fun thing to do. They're not really that useful. Getting kills with specific weapons and then the speed runs, which were a new thing added to all three games. There are three chapters where I had to speed run them and they were relatively easy, nothing too hard. First game follows Nathan Drake and he wants to find his ancestor's treasure, Sir Francis Drake, and it eventually leads him to El Dorado. Along with his journey, he has Sully with him, who's always been there for him, sort of as his partner in crime, but also a father figure. And then Elena Fisher, who just sort of brings herself along because she wanted a TV show and then Drake and Sully just kind of left her. So I kind of forgot about Sully getting killed in this one or just getting shot and dying, quote unquote. And I just can't imagine a world or game where Sully isn't alive because that would be pretty weird and it would leave Nate in a very dark place if he ever did lose him but you know Sully comes back because he wanted to stall time for both him and Elena. Elena's a good balance to Nate. Nate wants to just sort of jump into situations without thinking about it and then somehow get out of it. Elena is much more let's think about this and talk about this before trying to get ourselves killed. The villain I think was named Roman. He's super forgettable just I don't really care about him and it even makes it worse because he was betrayed by Navarro and then he wanted to sell the treasure. Eddie's the best one because because he's just trying to bust Nate's balls throughout the whole game even in a very scary situation during the creatures part he still has to one up Nate and then speaking of the creatures that was my favorite part of the game once Nate gets into the ship and bunker area and it's like all but just dark hallways and dead ends I love that part because it essentially turns into a survival horror game for one chapter or two which is great and then it turns out the treasure is actually a curse that turns you into a zombie like creature but then eventually the creature as well and so can't really use or sell that anymore Nate is able to stop Navarro and then take that treasure down with him. In terms of set pieces, because Uncharted is pretty much known for having like really good action set pieces, this one only has the creature parts. Aside from that though, it doesn't really have anything I mean, I guess the fortress is really memorable, but the creature is the only thing I really liked about it. The jungle areas, that's not really interesting to me at all. And I can also platinum this game on the PS3 version. The only issue I'm running into is the freezing issues, which I thought was just a me issue, but no, after just googling the issue, it turns out to be a known issue it was never patched and so just to fix it just don't play the game until you want to for me it's been almost a year since the freezing issue and so i do plan on going back to it In the second game, now Drake is looking for the treasure of Shambhala, which turns out to be the Tree of Life. And he reunites with Chloe, who is a former partner, and they sort of reignite their relationship. But throughout the game, you find out that they're not really compatible at all. Nate is still wanting to play the hero, even going after Chloe on the train, and she herself says, nah, just stop. Contrast that to Elena, who is back and with a camera now, but now with Jeff the cameraman, who dies, they get attacked, he dies, doesn't matter. But like Nate, she's very optimistic and is willing to see the good in pretty much every situation while Chloe just wants to get out of any sort of situation that puts her in danger at all. The tree of life isn't really a cursed treasure because it heals the face of Lazarvage but then it can be dangerous and become a curse because it grants a person pretty much being invincible so in that aspect I guess it needs to be destroyed. Lazarvage is pretty much a monster. He is willing to kill his men for stealing little and petty things. He's the reason why Elena is out here talking about the horrible things he's been and doing and his personality is a contrast to Nate who throughout this entire game is being a hero trying to save Elena saving Chloe Nate isn't gonna become a monster just because Lazarvage wants it to happen even though Nate is still killing people I mean they're like bad guys and so you know who cares but that's sort of his whole arc of not being a monster and learning just to walk away and let the guardians take care of him and then as for notable set pieces the entire train sequence once Nate gets on it getting that minigun and shooting the helicopters and getting a rocket launcher and fighting that one guy that has a dagger and then all of it leading to that opening scene of the entire game where Nate is waking up and you're also wondering why the hell is he covered in blood and shot and hanging from a goddamn train and then everything in the snow I also really liked as well. Sully sort of takes a back seat in this game however he won't be in
Uncharted 3. So the main focus is about Nate and Sully. There's flashbacks to how he met him when Nate tried to steal Sully's wallet. That's when he meets Marlo who pretty much is a despicable person and Sully saves him from getting killed for one of her men. Train him up, be a better thief, be better at jumping off trains or hanging on to stuff. And so in the present it's looking a lot more different because Sully was like I don't know in his mid 30s maybe late early 40s during that flashback Nate was just a kid Nate's around that age now and Sully he's looking old as hell and so the story is how long can Sully stay around until he can't anymore because it seems like they were setting up for Sully to die which I think he probably should have I don't want him to die but this is the story they were having in this game so why not just commit to it I don't know it just sort of feels like a cop out setting up these flashbacks and Nate seeing Sully die through the water and everything and then after all of that not to actually commit to it because of Nate's constant urge to want to go on these adventures and bring along people but then doesn't realize that he might be the cause of them dying as well. Marlo and Talbot they're fine. Most of the villains they're fine because I don't really care about them. There's no real reason for me to care about them when all I care about is watching Nate interact with Sully, Chloe, Elena, all his friends and buddies going on adventures. Apparently both are from a society that Sir Francis Rick was also a part of and all they want is control and power which is what they have once they all get to the city of Irem. That's what they want from the water and whatever it's causing it in the water. Nate's entire whole arc is trying to prove something. Elena brings up that he needs to stop aside from getting treasure and making some money off of it. Not only is he putting himself in danger but Sully as well and pretty much people around him. Charlie broke his entire leg just for this treasure and Nate. There comes a time when he just needs to stop which he does by the end of it. He tries to save Marlo from that quicksand and I'm still sort of confused on why. He said it was personal. That's why he wanted to prove to I guess Talbot and Marlo I guess going back to that flashback but still it's like just let it go and he still insists on going into that plane crashing in the desert and then the treasure or not treasure but the lost city turns out that entire thing is also sort of a curse because of the water and then the set pieces the burning house Syria with Charlie and Chloe was also really good the entire sea section where you're stuck at sea the plane going to the desert loved all that and then once Nate and Sully got to the lost city that was also really gorgeous to look at the more the games go on the more I start to like a lot of the set pieces uncharted golden abyss the only reason i even have this game is because of my brother-in-law i got a free vita because he didn't want it anymore so i was like sure i've never had the vita before and there's trophies to them so more platinums to earn for me out of all the four games he had uncharted golden abyss was one of them i kind of forgot about this game because this is a launch day game there's a lot of forced in controls like the movement and the swiping on the vita that was the big selling point for the vita and i just wanted to play an uncharted game and while this is still very much an uncharted game it's held back by all the weird motion controls and swiping the entire last boss on the hardest difficulty i failed so many times because i had to swipe up down left right curve left whatever and i just wasn't prepared for it even getting the treasures was kind of weird because during the entire talk with sully you just have to tap on the glowing parts and then even maps you have to scratch off or like put up to like a light i think during certain puzzles and so i legit was going up and sort of just putting my vita up in the air it was just really weird this is a prequel before for the first game there's Dante I think your friend or not buddy who's working for the main villain once again a villain who I don't really care about the story is pretty much like the other games looking for a treasure to sell but Golden Abyss is a really forgettable one with very memorable motion controls create your superstar design your moves tell your story and share it with the world WWE Smackdown vs Raw 2010 it's your world now my first platinum for 2023 was WWE Smackdown vs Raw 2010. This is a nostalgia game for me. I was a huge wrestling fan back in the day and I still am but I just don't have time to watch. There's trophies for creating a superstar, a highlight reel, a new move, new costumes for your creative superstar or even the main roster stuff. There's a career mode which is the most grindy part about the game but it shouldn't take you too long as long as you have a 5 star match for every one of your matches then you're good. The checklist I remember being very hard when I was a kid because I didn't really understand how I can do certain moves but there was only like certain superstars that had certain finishers or moves and then the main part I remember about this game was the road to Wrestlemania's. A lot of these I'm not gonna lie are pretty much recycled storylines from actual like WWE storylines. Mickey James you either had to choose Natalia or Kendrick. Natalia is a stalker to Mickey James which is pretty much the same storyline from Wrestlemania 22 when Trish had Mickey James as her stalker and their 
deserves that infamous lick at the event. And so I chose Kendrick because he was being a gentleman about like asking her out on a date and they go on a date. Natalia is jealous or something like that. If you choose Natalia, Kendrick betrays you and has the other wrestlers beat up Mickey James. Natalia is wearing Mickey James's costume. You beat her at WrestleMania and keep her title. This one was alright. The dating with Kendrick wasn't too interesting. And then the stalker stuff with Natalia, that was also fine. Orion's story is pretty much legacy betrayal main event at wrestlemania in a triple threat match and then also the legend killer urko dusty Rhodes, a million dollar man and so again kind of a nod to legacy's future story and orton's very early on run with bob orton and taking off legends one by one hbk has a retirement story and this one is once again okay because the actual retirement story with him and undertaker was really good jbl is kind of the catalyst to having michael's quit or retire because of his ankle injury edge's road to wrestlemania is all about control he gets very close to maria and purposely gets her injured and so now he's the gm of smackdown has some ladies over for a sweet time screws out big show mr kennedy for the wwe champion all of it eventually catches up to him and maria knows all of this has him in a steel cage match against kennedy and depending on whether you get out of the cage she'll either close the door on kennedy and she chooses you or she pretty much doesn't choose you if you don't get out brand warfare is i think the only one that's kind of original but it's still sort of brand versus brand big show decides to start a war a brand war against cena who is representing raw and then triple h who is representing smackdown i had to play as both cena and triple h but by the end i chose triple h because he had the easier signature move to finish her i chose a false count anywhere's match for the last match and then i won the champions of champions which it's fine not my favorite design but this was the most fun i had with the story and then the created superstar story is pretty much kind of like stone cold steve austin did to vince back in the attitude era you start this story by winning the ic title from santino you just go week by week having the ic title beat up santino some more a royal rumble you're screwed because you're the first entrant vince tries to screw you by doing that also at the elimination chamber by having you fight in that wearing like a chicken hat stealing your gear vince was even a referee at one point and he slowed his ass down for the one two three count which was pretty funny and then at wrestlemania you have a gauntlet match facing santino mark henry vince himself and i think one more but eventually after all that i chose to put him through that table putting me through hell because i wasn't a real wrestler no screw that i am taking his ass out Platinum number 17. I decided to get PS Plus and this is when they were launching the three different tiers, Essential, Extra, and Premium. I got a Premium mainly due to the PS3 games that were a part of the Classic Catalog. There are still a bunch of PS3 titles that I have not played, but the first game that I got when getting PS Plus was Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag. I went with this game because there were multiplayer trophies, but also at this point I wanted to get every single Assassin's Creed game Platinum. However, for Unity, the servers are shut down. I think there's a way to work around on that but here's the thing i'm lazy if i can't access it just by going to the online menu or section then i'm not gonna do it i'm just willing to let that go but getting back to black flag the two multiplayer trophies that you should look out for are leveling up to level 55 and using every single weapon getting to level 55 just took time there's still people playing this game on the ps4 version this game is now 10 years old and so i was like well okay there's gonna be maybe some waiting time during the lobby but no it was relatively quick i didn't have to wait like five minutes but because this this game has been out for so long there are certain people that are good at the game because they didn't stop playing this game so trying to get kills or do objectives that took a lot of time getting killed by other players but eventually level 55 i got to it using every weapon there's no in-game checklist for this on my phone i wrote on notes on every weapon and when i used it or not i could also see why people would love this game not only because of the pirate stuff and the ship stuff but because of the main character being edward throughout most of the game he doesn't choose a side he just so happens happens to run across in Templar and he gets their costume and everything and he uses both sides to his advantage so that he can gain food money whatever it is for his own benefit and throughout the game he's always telling himself this that he doesn't really need or care about anyone he left his older life to be a pirate by the end he realizes that he's all alone everyone that he's cared for they've either left him or died and the only family he has left is pretty much the assassins and so by the end he chooses their side because to him they are his new family the whole pirate stuff is 
is really fun and ships are even better than third game the third game had ship levels but it was very limited on what weapons you can use this one has a ton more and then oh yeah the present day stuff worker at abstergo fix or hack computers that's it let the new era begin Mortal Kombat 11 was next and in terms of fighting games and their platinum list this one was relatively easy because every time I look at a trophy list for a fighting game it's always the online trophies play 300 matches or win 300 matches 300 isn't even that much but as someone who doesn't play a lot of fighting games it's just like nah I'm not playing that much MK11 only requires 50 casual matches which is so easy the hardest trophy was honestly the advanced tutorial section there's a certain section where you need to cancel into like another move or something like that and maybe it's because i suck but this tutorial was so damn hard it took me a good like 30 minutes to get through it when the others took a couple of tries and i don't know why it took forever maybe there's a very specific time window for that like specific input but that was surprisingly the hardest trophy in the game there's ai battles i guess it's for the grinding for gear which i think the launch for this game getting coins and gear and getting brutalities was super rough like you needed to play the hell out of this game to get all that stuff and so luckily i played the patched version which gives you a lot more coins and all the hearts a lot easier and faster fighting in 250 towers i thought was going to be also another grind i had to do but there's a known glitch and technique for this you just choose one of the towers get in and then back out that's all you have to do the actual gameplay itself i've seen people play this game both competitively and just casually and it doesn't look fun to watch getting to actually play this game it's not the most fun i feel like mkx was fun both to watch and play and for mk11 it's the opposite where it's like yeah it's kind of all right which sucks because everything else about the game is great the intros and outros of every characters and every different dialogue interactions all of that is really fun the story is also fun and then the crypt as well is also fun getting Shao Kahn's hammer or Kenshi's headband get through all the different sort of levels throughout MK was also a lot of fun and then the story involves time travel which means there's time travel shenanigans older characters meet the younger selves Kronika is the main villain and she controls time Time. all she wants is balance and since Raiden has ruined that plans to balance that by having characters meet each other and place certain characters in certain areas and stuff like that she has Garrus to help with her which he looks cool but I have no desire to play him and then Cetrion's whatever she's one of the elder gods that works for Kronika and then she also uses the dark versions of Liu Kang, Kung Lao, and Katana all those other dark versions from MKX it gets to a certain point in the story where it turns out Liu Kang and Raiden have been fighting all the time in different universes whether it's during armageddon it's at the subway or whether Liu Kang's evil or raiden's evil it doesn't matter chronica always has them fighting because if they both combine their powers it will ruin her plans and so that's what raiden does by the end he loses all of his powers and puts it all into Liu Kang, having fire god Liu Kang, and he looks cool and he eventually defeats chronica setting up a new timeline for the future games and so they're already like resetting this timeline which does sort of bring up kind of an issue of like being invested there's no reason for me to invest in certain characters when i know they're gonna come back so like for example in chapter one sonya dies but then immediately in the next chapter she's back as her younger self everything's gonna either reset or something's gonna happen to like bring them back and so that's kind of the issue with this story as much as i love it and all the time travel stuff there's no reason to be invested in it and it still has the same issue from the previous games which there are certain chapters that aren't needed that feel like they're just wasting time like Jade's chapter didn't do much for me. Her and Kotal Khan catch up, realizes he's a bad, bad man, and then they get caught. Jackie and Jack's chapter achieves getting the crown for Kronika, but older Jack's about being safe, didn't really care. And then Sonya's entire fight club section with Kano felt super unnecessary as well. Went back to the Uncharted series with The Lost Legacy and this time around you don't play as Nathan Drake, you play as Chloe, which is a nice change of pace. She has sort of the same quippy line at any situation and Nadine tags along who's from the fourth game and she's a more likable character in this game because in the fourth one she's pretty much a henchman who just kicks Nate's ass and anyone that stands her in a way and then she's the one that gets away. Seeing her have more of a character, be more human, for the most part she's all about business and while Chloe's just like cracking jokes here and there and then I love by the 
Gideon lower her guards around Chloe and then makes a joke about losing the tusk of ganache. Because every game so far, Nate has not gotten the treasure that he was looking for or the treasure was a curse. This time around, Chloe and Nadine, with the help of Sam, actually have the tusk to sell for money. Sam Drake gets involved very late into the game as he was helping out Chloe and sort of the reason why Nadine and Chloe veer off later on as well because of the connections to the Drake brothers. But he's here just to lighten up the mood, which I think is good for him. I don't mind the character. And then chapter 4 is the most non-linear part about the game. It's such a big area that you can go around and collect treasures and collect that bracelet to look for treasures. And so it's the most standout part about the game. It's just another adventure with another set of characters that you already know and already well established. And it works without Nate. All four infamous games were available on PS Plus, and I played all of them. All four games are fun to play, but I realized that the story itself, I don't really care about. It's not the main reason why I play these games, it's gameplay. And I've also realized most of the games I've been playing are open world games, and while I'm not burned out just yet by this point, I am getting a little like, mm, maybe I should play, you know, something else. The story itself is, again, very basic, very fine. Play as Cole McGrath, he's just a normal delivery guy, somehow gets powers, which are named conduits. In this game and there's this big bad named Kessler and Cole wants to defeat him whether it's good or bad both endings kind of end the same as well he's got his best friend Zeke with him his girl it turns out Kessler shows you his future and how there's this entity called the beast he is destroying the city and it killed Kessler's family Kessler uses his powers to travel back in time to create conduits and be prepared for the beast it turns out to be Cole himself from the future he came back in time to prepare himself and he was willing to kill his wife for it as well and so the ending is what I remember from this game because it sort of comes out of nowhere and kind of is the only time that I was invested in the story which is the setup for Infamous 2, getting rid of the beast. And so it's got the same sort of trophies as the first game, collecting all the shards and doing side missions, good and evil, having to go through the game a second time. The generated missions, which were still available as of 2023. I'm not sure if Sucker Punch is planning on keeping these missions up, but once they go down, that means this game won't be able to have its platinum anymore. Quo and Nyx are sort of the two people you have to choose in terms of being good and evil. Quo has ice powers and she's the good side while Nyx has fire element type of power and encourages Cole to do some very bad and evil things. Personally I prefer the ice powers because it just looks cooler and unlike the first game there are two endings. So the good ending is saving humanity from the beast. There's a reveal that he's John. I think he used to work with Quo and I don't care. Not only do you defeat the beast but save humanity from being conduits because there's not an issue of people wanting to become conduits creates more issues. Cole has to sacrifice himself and so he does that leaving Zeke to mourn him alone while the bad ending has you becoming the beast the thing you were planning on hunting and beating all along turns out he will become the beast and create even more conduits more conduits means more chaos and you have to kill zeke which was tough for him to do and so based on this i just prefer the good ending because killing zeke not a fan even though he does betray you in the first game because of jealousy cole was willing to forgive him and so not a fan of that also just becoming the beast clearly the whole point was to get rid of him infamous second son was a day one launch game for the ps4 and since cole sacrificed himself for humanity seven years pass and you play as delson was a normal person normal kid somehow gets these powers and has to decide whether to be good or bad he has his brother there to keep him in check person he meets fetch who also has powers and eugene who also can like hack things and whatnot like with the other games collectibles side missions turn my controller sideways and shake it because once again sony wants like the move controller thing to be a thing really weird weird but it's a collectible. Augustine is a conduit who's the main villain and her motive and goal is to protect all conduits and like many others she was just a human was given powers she was in the military and at a certain point was given a choice to either side with humanity and conduits working for the government and pretending to lock up conduits even though she's not really doing that she in her mind is trying to protect them and so it's up to Delzen to either kill her or show everyone what she's up to. The good ending has you stopping Augustine not killing her but stopping her reign as getting all conduits and whatnot and because throughout the game you are good he was able to show that both humans and conduits can coexist both fetch and eugene need someone to follow so whether it's the good or bad ending they're both willing to follow dozen and then the bad ending has you killing augustine right in front of everyone being ruthless he's shown throughout the game that conduits can be trusted and are monsters betty who very early on is sort of like the person that helps both him and his brother and somewhere in the story his brother dies and so betty's disappointed 
disappointed that went on to become a monster. She wanted him to be better. And once she mentions her brother, he's like, you know what? I'm gonna kill her. So he just goes up in the sky and drops. And then that's when it cuts to black or cuts the title screen. And while I prefer the good ending, this ending is kind of shocking. So I do like it. Just kind of like after all this time, keeping his promise to Betty. But hey, I won't kill Betty, right? Nope. Brother mentioned she has to die. The infamous first light, it's a much shorter game. You play as Fetch and you see where she was before the events of Second Son. She was captured once again by Augustine and she wants revenge because someone killed her brother. Killed that one guy who I forgot about. I have to play through the game only one time which is great. The only difference being that the arena mode, it's sort of like an arcade type minigame where you just have to get the highest score and then once you do that you get all the trophies. It's really simple, nothing difficult. Fetch as a character, she's alright. I don't love or hate her like Eugene and even Cole they're all right i don't know where you go from here because sucker punch they're making ghost of tsushima too and people love that and so i don't know i really like the gameplay of all the games but everything else is like it's fine Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. So my history with Star Wars is that I don't really care about it. I've seen most of the movies except for, I mean, I guess all of them if you don't count the Star Wars Holiday Special, which from what I've heard and seen is just a complete miserable time. Half of them I like, half of them I don't care about. And then I tried watching Mandalorian Episode 1. I don't care. And then Andor, I realized I don't really care about this universe at all. But what I will engage in is a Star Wars game because it's a game. Why not give it a try? and i like it it's a fun game seeing a bunch of different types of enemies and having a lightsaber going around killing them or bouncing off bullets off of stormtroopers is really cool why is fast travel not a thing the map itself having it be in 3d was a bit confusing and since i don't care about star wars i couldn't tell you what happened in this game in terms of the story i think vader shows up at the end because everyone loves vader he kills the main villain The first Resident Evil remake was available and luckily I got this before it was taken out from PS Plus which I didn't realize until very later on that games would be taken off. This first game, it's really good. This was supposed to be a 6 playthrough game but then it turned into a 8 or 9 because I didn't play on the same save file for all the costumes to get the trophy and so I had to play 2 additional playthroughs which would be an issue but this would help in the long run later on with the speedrun trophies and real survival world and item box and stuff because this game will reward you for replaying the game over and over again. I have planned for a completely separate run for the speedrun playthroughs but then my first playthrough was completed in 11 hours and then the next one was just over 5 hours and then the next one was under 3 hours and so I started to realize that I didn't need to worry about the speedrun trophies. The more you play, the more you know where items are and the more you know where to go. Real survivor mode cuts out all the item boxes from being shared. This was very later on during my playthrough. I knew where to put certain items and certain item boxes because they were closer to where I needed to go. Making real survival mode not too hard to get through at all. Visiting all the places. I had to redo this like I think three times because I thought I was going to every single room but no it turns out I always kept missing the room where the shark is. After draining all the water I had to like go back go into that first room where you meet that shark and then there's a door to the right and then there's just one room in there. I always miss. There are so many missable trophies in this one. It included be run and visiting all place trophies but there's some that are tied to saving or not saving characters so beating the game not saving rebecca not saving barry or chris saving barry saving rebecca saving chris and or jill depending on which character you play it's also like damn i have to replay this over and over again but again this game was a lot of fun so i didn't mind having to play it almost eight or nine times after getting the saving barry trophy afterwards i would never save him because his magnum gun one shot the tyrant i chose jill for most of my runs because she had more items and because of the magnum so while bear was super suspect throughout the entire game turns out he was actually a good person sorry man but i gotta take his gun and just leave him with lisa trevor the story for so here's the thing i've realized about the re stories they are just kind of convoluted the story for this one is really simple umbrella was doing illegal experiments and they created like the spiders the giant snake the zombies and whatnot and so they sent wesker in there to destroy all and any evidence wesker 
Oscar would pay the price for it through a tyrant. And while there are different endings, I think the ideal ending is Chris, Jill, Barry, and Rebecca all being alive. And then, oh yeah, I almost forgot the invisible mode. I didn't know what this was. Enemies are invisible now, which wasn't too hard because I was already very familiar with the game. But I didn't expect the actual bosses to turn invisible. When that giant snake turned invisible, I was like, you're telling me all the bosses are actually invisible? And they are. And so that was kind of a nice twist too. I was like, oh wait, I wasn't expecting the actual bosses to be invisible. So after R1 Remake, I needed a break not only from very notable IPs but also open world because I was playing a lot of them. So since there were a catalog of games available to me, pick and choose which ones I would play to just venture out because a lot of these games I would not have paid at all but because they're free, I was like okay why not. And the first one being Cars Race Orama. Do not care about the Cars franchise or movies at all. The only reason I know about Cars is because of McDonald's. My mom used to work at McDonald's and sometimes she would bring up Happy Meals. At the time, they were doing a collaboration with the Cars movies and I used to have these, you know, little cars. But the actual game itself, it's alright, you know, just gotta win races, race everywhere, nothing too hard at all. It's very simple. Magus is an awful game. The only reason I chose to platinum this game is because of how short it was. But you just shoot magic green or blue orbs. And I thought this game was an older game because it looked and felt like an older game. But no. It turns out this game was released in 2014. And I was just shocked to find out that a game like this can come out in 2014. What came out in 2014? Yeah like Bayonetta 2 I think. And there's a ton of games that do more than one move magic orb thing in this game. So don't play this game. Get ready for the next battle. Tekken 7, once again, this is another fighting game that was relatively easy. The online trophies were just fighting 10 times and win one player ranked in tournament match. There were a few trophies that I got naturally getting through all the different stages in a stage or level. There is some tied to practice mode, which is getting like the most damage or doing a certain move. And then there are some tied to the story mode, which I'll be honest, I've never paid attention to the story of Tekken because as someone just looking from the outside, the story seems insane. Heihachi is training like a bear to be like him. I think the bear wants to marry the panda. I don't know. There's just some weird stuff. It sort of works because Tekken is a franchise that's never taken itself too seriously and so I don't mind it. The story pretty much ends the rivalry of Heihachi and Kazuya. What seems like forever now, father and son wanted to kill each other because Heihachi fell in love with Kazumi, had a kid. She turned out to be the devil, claims that Heihachi would be a bad person in the future or something like that and he strangled her because he he no longer saw Kazumi, he saw a monster which is why he's so hard on Kazuya and then eventually plans on killing him and then Kazuya plans also to kill him after finding out what happened. And so in the end, after the narrator narrates his story and meets Lars and that part of the story I didn't really like, it felt just kind of there, like why have this person narrate when you can just have scenes of characters interacting, like I don't know but after all of that Kazuya does the same that Heihachi did to him when he was a kid and he throws him in the lava killing Heihachi forever. Now will this actually be Heihachi's farewell? Maybe because based on Tekken 8, Tekken 8 doesn't have a minute and Reina is like a kid of his. It seems like Harada and the team they want to move on from Heihachi and now the question is what's next for the story because do they go sort of the same route with Kazuya and Jin? Another father-son rivalry that's gonna go on forever and ever or is Jin gonna repeat the same thing to his own father or is Kazuya just gonna be on top again like who knows honestly i want the story to be as ridiculous as possible because i feel like it would thrive in that ridiculousness rather than trying to have a narrator in there or trying to ground it no 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 make it more ridiculous and then the last game of this venturing out was Adventure Time, Pirate of whatever it's called. Once again, another IP that I don't care about. I never grew up watching Adventure Time and forgot about this game. I forgot how or when I got this platinum. You play, there's like the robot thing and yeah, I don't know. I don't have much to say about it because I forgot about it. So it's just kind of here.
Resident Evil 7. Capcom didn't need to reinvent RE at all because Resident Evil 6 sold over 11.4 million units and they could have just been like, okay, game sold well, let's do more action stuff. But the critical reception was not that great. So they reinvented Resident Evil again by having the player play in a first person perspective, experiencing all this weird, creepy stuff with the bigger family and Evelyn, the old ass lady, mold people or mold creatures. There is sort of a Resident Evil tradition trophies which is the speedrun trophy completing the game in under four hours the you know item box trophy and only using three heals like with re1 remake i do hope that these stay for the rest of the games that i play because it's essentially forcing me to play the game in a different way and rewards replayability and then the nt coin now i thought there was only one set of coins i had to collect for the normal difficulty playthrough i didn't realize until the madhouse difficulty that there were a different set and different trophy for different coins and so i thought okay i'm done with all the collectibles i can just play madhouse house but no i was like oh wait that antique quick is not in the same like underground area as it was last time so i had to look it up and yeah turns out there's more to collect madhouse difficulty wasn't too hard until the jack final form fight every other boss fight i had enough ammo and heals to get through the fight but then this fight i failed a good amount of times because i didn't have enough ammo i ran out i was just running around in circles and i had to kill myself and then i didn't realize that i was missing shots and they eventually got past them and then the entire baker family are all really memorable characters jack of course is the first boss you fight around the bigger house crashing through walls chasing after you and then that chainsaw fight with them was also really good margaret turning into a goddamn spider-like creature crawling around windows watching that videotape of mia and then having to avoid her mistake as well lucas setting up puzzles like that birthday cake puzzle but he's not that recognizable he's just an annoying person to deal with and then zoe's the one that's helping you out with the phone calls and making the cure i chose mia over her because ethan came here for mia not zoe but then we'll call for help later on the main story surrounds around ethan winters who is looking for his partner mia who's been missing for i think a couple of years now and so you know he goes into the woods he sees jack kind of walking in the woods kind of creeped out but you know what still willing to go goes in the baker house and finds out this ain't no normal kidnapping because jack cuts off your hands and heals it by using the first aid kit and then the couple that comes around gets his head cut off by a shovel jake doesn't want to die i do kind of find it weird that you don't ever see his face as someone who's like the main protagonist for this game in eight it's a really weird choice to have him be faceless because we see the other characters faces but not ethan i don't know it's just kind of weird evelyn turns out once again she was experimented on and then eventually led to her mold powers and they infected all the bakers in the surrounding area which once i got into that ship section i lose interest all the time because the entire baker all of that's really good and then once you get out of that it's like wait a minute there's this tacked on like ship section where you find out what happened to evelyn and mia mia ties to her and it's like oh yeah i guess they need to explain why this happened but just kind of having this out on felt there's more and even evelyn's final like fight you just need to shoot her a ton of times that's really it and then chris looks weird because of you know no arms he's very slim don't know why he looks that way but he does the next handful of games were games that are going to leave PS Plus, and one of them were Naruto Shippuden Ultimate Ninja Storm 4. So I am a huge Naruto fan, since this is the last, well I guess until the Connections one that came out recently, but this game told the story of the war arc leading up to Naruto and Sasuke's final battle. The ultimate survival trophy of getting past 30 opponents was really hard for some reason until I found a video on using, I think the Sasuke Renegon version, where if you just spam his special, you'll get through 30 opponents really quickly. and then. There's an adventure mode which I'm tracked that there isn't a game like this already just surrounding around this mode of Naruto or whoever you choose going around the Lee village or San just talking to like various Naruto characters but it does get repetitive because after talking to some people you get in a fight. The story starts with Hashirama and Madara's flashback fight and then him telling Sasuke about the history of the Leaf village and then once Sasuke tells his answer Team Taka, the four Hokages and Orochimaru leave to the war. Neji dying still isn't a really great moment because it just comes out of nowhere and he's really the only major death aside from like the villains there are a lot of people that die in this war but they're characters that i don't care about since this is war i feel like more memorable or characters that i care about should have died team 7 reuniting was a great moment and sasuke just coming and being like i'm gonna become hokage it's still a hilarious moment kakashi versus obito is still great probably one of the best fights in the series obito's regrets about not being hokage because this whole time being toby or madara he wanted 
someone to prove him wrong that the world that they were living in was hell. And it's not until Naruto that he's able to convince Obito to come back into the light and break out from his mask. Madara of course rises, which then leads to him getting six paths and then Guy's eight gates moment, the one big moment for Guy. And then Hagoromo showing up, I don't mind this as much. Ain't there are Ashra connections and being destined? Does it kind of convolute and sort of wreck on the fact that working hard gets you to be a great ninja? It sort of does. I guess Kishimoto wanted a reason for Naruto and Sasuke to fight again, but maybe there could have been a different way. And then that leads to Kaguya, which anytime it wasn't a 3D arena fighter, rail shooter thing with the Susano sections, getting S rank for most of them are easy. But then these flying sections and killing Kaguya and all that stuff was annoying with the game leaving, added to my frustrations and stress on like beating this game before it leaves. And then the final battle, which is still a great fight. And then of course, with Tak no Jutsu, Naruto is able to uh, get Sasuke to stop him from being alone. Resident Evil Revelations 2 was that part of the games that were leaving PS Plus? I was already playing the game before finding out that certain games were leaving. This is the hardest RE game to platinum because of there being no new game plus for the invisible mode, pretty much on the hardest difficulty. And I also didn't replay this game as much as RE7 or RE1. Resident. For some reason, I decided to play this mode on my second playthrough. So while I knew where certain enemies were, I didn't know every single minute detail on like where enemies would pop up. I had to really find that out by dying over and over again. Countdown mode is the speedrun trophies. And so once again, a speedrun related trophies are tied to another Resident Evil game, which is great. There are medals in this game. They're sort of like GTA 5 or Red Dead 2's medals. And luckily I can get all these medals separately. I don't have to get all of them in one playthrough. And I never knew Natalia or Moira as the main fighters because they're really there only for like support and maybe some story events, but that's really it. And then the story for this game, I can take it or leave it. It's really nothing too memorable. You play as Claire and Moira and then switch to Barry and then Natalia, which every time it ends, I'm always reminded, oh yeah, this is supposed to be played episodically. But Claire and Moira are gone. They get kidnapped, which then forces Barry to come out looking for them. He meets Natalia and this little girl is tied to Wesker, the sister to Wesker, which I didn't even know was a thing. He has siblings. I don't care about her, man. The story never gives me any reason to care aside from Barry's back, which is cool. He's a lot older now, and then Claire's also back. But yeah, that's really it. Marvel's Spider-Man for some reason was leaving PS Plus even though it's a Sony property it was exclusively on PS4 until the remastered version came out on PS5 and PC I think but yeah it was leaving so I had always planned on playing it but then with it leaving I was like okay I might as well just get through it and this is a Spider-Man game which means Peter has too much responsibilities he has to take care of Aunt May with this whole party thing with Martin Lee MJ and him are in a weird spot where she knows about the Spider-Man stuff but then they didn't really work out. Doc Ock is a great mentor to Peter and then dealing with the whole entire Sinister Six was also really cool. I played on the easiest difficulty and then didn't upgrade anything because I knew in advance that there wouldn't be enough upgrade and points for getting all the costumes and so I didn't use any for upgrades or abilities. I waited until the very end of the game and then bought all the costumes and then go back into my manual save with all the other you know upgrades and points and then upgrade all my abilities so that I don't have to replay the game again. And then the Doc Ock story so pretty much everyone knew where this would lead. It's how it gets there. The journey of how this man who is a, you know, teacher and mentor to Peter turns into Doc Ock. Martin Lee or Mr. Negative was an unknown villain for me. I don't know who he was, but he actually turned out to be a really good character of wanting revenge against Norman Osborn for killing his parents. And so he turned all of that negativity into a power and he can even get inside of Peter's mind as well. The Miles and MJ parts, I guess I can get why they're there because they're there to take a break from Spider-Man but also don't really care about them but I don't really care what MJ is doing or Miles even though Miles turns out to be Spider-Man later on and then also didn't expect a car at the end of a Spider-Man game you know Aunt May knew who Peter was and in the end she knew that he would do the right thing on whether to choose to save Aunt May or the rest of New York and so that was really good and then oh yeah the swinging or swinging around New York is really fun Deadlight Director's Cut was leaving and I've never heard of this game before. It was a side-scrolling survival horror game. That's what pretty much got me to play it. It is a good game. It is a good, fun, trying to get by zombies through platforms and pretty much try to avoid them. I barely shot any of the zombies. It's only when I had to. The first playthrough was easy enough getting all the collectibles and whatnot. And they even survival mode, which is just a mode to kill zombies. Two trophies are really easy. Surviving 13 minutes and 43 seconds. There's a known area where you go into this 
closet area and you just wait and sit there for like 13 minutes and then you're good and then killing 200 zombies you have to go up to like the third or second floor and then jump between a hole shoot 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 jump shoot 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 and then jump back and forth until there's too much and then you should have around 200 zombies killed that challenge comes on nightmare mode which is pretty much a permadeath mode there are no checkpoints and i need to finish the game on the hardest difficulty in one sitting i've always heard about permadeath modes and this one isn't too bad because it's only like three to four hour game if you take your time you know i was like okay shouldn't be too bad i was designed to simple mundane things that i should have died on because i was walking on eggshells the entire time after a certain point i was like you know what i'm gonna look up a video guide because i didn't want to take any chances on dying on very simple things and the game was leaving so i needed to finish this game really quickly and then after following that video i pretty much got the platinum Virginia had a very interesting premise, having no dialogue throughout the entire game and just having the story being told by what's going on on screen. And after a certain point, that did absolutely nothing for me. I sort of lost interest halfway through. My first playthrough was blind. I didn't collect anything or do anything at all. I just sort of went through the game as normal and then kind of worked out because there's a trophy for completing the game two times. So that's when I did all the collectibles and optional stuff, but it's a narrative adventure game that sort of got me, but then I just lost interest. Kona. This game made me realize not to play any sort of walking simulation games because I was bored out of my mind playing this. It was really short, but early on I was like, is this all there is to it? Finding collectibles and walk. I was like, okay, this is not for me. But once again, it's a very short platinum. I went through with it. But then I made a fatal mistake of forgetting one goddamn campfire. So guess what? After completing the first playthrough, I thought my game's glitched. What's going on? How come platinum is a popping? Oh no, I saw the fire camp trophies. I had to replay it. Oh, all over again did all the whole seeing ghost people or whatever it was and then got the final campfire the platinum pop and then i just moved on relicta was the last game i played before it was gonna leave ps plus and i didn't realize that this was a puzzle game once again a short game try to figure out puzzles but then after looking at the trophy list there's a speedrun trophy for beating the game in under six hours so once again video guide and i got through the game in under six hours did everything collect all the collectibles it is a fun puzzle game but once once again, I was rushing through this game. There were certain puzzles that I was like, yeah, I would not have figured this out unless a video showed me. I probably won't ever do this again, trying to rush and get through a bunch of games that were going to leave PS Plus because out of the six games, there were only two that I really wanted to play, which were Naruto and Spider-Man. The others were more like I was interested in playing, but I wasn't going to pay full price for them. So I gave them a try and then looked up trophy guides for it. And they're going to take under, you know, 10, eight hours. I was like, okay, cool. I can just get through them. Caused me to get burned out. So. So I did take a bit of a break after this. Resident Evil 6 so after going through a bunch of games and a bit of a break, I came back with a game where by the end of it, I was tired by it, and that was Resident Evil 6. This is a very well-known game for it being very big and just sort of not focused at all. Like with the previous RE games, there's collectibles, serpent emblems, there are specific trophies tied to specific chapters and specific characters, and of course, there's professional difficulty, which was made easier for me because I had the Magna infinite ammo thing this isn't a hard game to get through but it sort of bored me because there are four goddamn campaigns and so much of it is just like what's going on this is why this is happening all right the only good thing about re6 is the mobility and mercenaries this is the most fun i've had with the mercenaries mode aside from that though like everything else is either just all right not focused or just straight up bad so i'm gonna try to remember all four campaigns leon and helena are supposed to be the horror zombie campaign even though all campaigns somewhat feel the same there are different things about them but overall they're kind of the same so leon teams up with helena and helena wants to find her sister her sister dies because of simmons so they're gonna go out there and kill simmons who i think have ties to umbrella there's a shot of him getting killed with a spike red blood bleeds all over umbrella ada shows up because you know leon and ada they have ties in the past and this one he confesses his love for ada he says that he loves ada ada has never shown any sort of like interest and leon would help him out 
out every now and then in two and four, but she doesn't really say it back. He just really loves her. By the end, Helena mourns her sister. They kill Simmons. Leon is all alone because Ada left for her own business. And then, oh yeah, meeting Chris. So, okay, when I think of Leon and Chris meeting each other for the first time, I'm thinking they're gonna team up for a mission. And it's not that at all. They first meet, they hold guns at each other. Chris and Pierce are after Ada for killing their man. It was just really disappointing. Chris and Pierce are supposed to be the action campaign and they're fighting I think B.O.W.s or just pretty much big huge monsters and in this one Chris doesn't feel like a leader because he let his men down and Pierce is here to help him get his leadership back team up with them go hunt some more B.O.W.s until Ada comes in and kills a lot of his men prompting him to go and kill Ada himself that's when he meets Helena and Leon and then they eventually get rid of Ada but then Pierce gets infected and I think it was clear as day that Chris was supposed to die he was supposed to be the one to sacrifice himself for the good of his own teammates. Capcom didn't want to pull the trigger and so they had Pierce die instead. And then by the end, Chris learns not to, I don't know, be a bad leader and appreciates his teammates. Something like that. Either way, it was fine. Jake and Sherry, their campaign is the Nemesis Doppelganger campaign where there's this Nemesis lookalike coming after them. They both meet both teams of Leon, Helena, Chris, and Pierce. The only interesting part was him meeting Chris. Jake's father is Wesker and he just wanted to ask him, was it personal or a mission turn out to be both so that was the only time where i was like oh this is cool and then i went back to being this is fine and by this point i was getting tired of this story there's no reason for me to be invested because there's just so much going on but after meeting chris after meeting leon sherry being back was cool both jake and sherry defeat the nemesis doppelganger both go their separate ways jake decides to i don't know be a hero his blood i think was important to the story to curing people i believe but yeah that's it and then finally hada she comes into the story because of simmons she gets a call by him saying that he should come take a look at what's going on and she's sort of the dark shadow that's just looking at every campaign and has her own story with another ada there's a ada clone and that was simmons daughter he used his own daughter to clone another ada because ada left him ada was working for simmons but then she left that bothered simmons so much that he created another clone of her because he really likes ada for just some reason i don't think it's ever explained i mean i guess it is because she's like a great asset either way it was just like this is really dumb i don't care anymore ada is the one that actually kill the other ada and after killing her she helps out kill simmons goes into a lab and there's another cocoon probably of another ada and she destroys that and all the evidence of her quote-unquote killing a bunch of people or whatnot so yeah i don't know i guess the story for all of these is ada i guess ada is the main villain but not really ada and simmons is the cause of all of this for everyone to meet each other and get the blood from jake Ratchet and Clank was one of those series that I've never grew up playing at all. It just never appealed to me as a kid. I always went with the Batman Arkham games, Uncharted, and then, you know, Call of Duty, but it still holds up. There are things that could be pretty much better probably in the later games. Not being able to strafe was really frustrating. You have to essentially turn back 180 if you want to hit your opponent. But aside from that, it's a very simple platinum in game. Collect everything, do all the skill points, which were new to me. Very specific things you have to do in specific planets. I did not know about the challenge mode getting harder enemies i thought okay challenge mode to get 1 million bolts it's essentially new game plus for the game but then enemies were a lot harder to kill getting 1 million bolts should have been easy there's a known glitch for one of the race tracks and once i got there i just held down the circle of x button to collect all the bolts and whatnot and then i walked away that was the first issue because i streamed this and i didn't know that there's a certain amount of time where if you don't move or touch the controller it will time you out i went away for a couple hours did some chores took a shower and whatnot and they came back to see that i was signed out i went back in did the glitch but it wasn't working and so then i found out that it is a one-time use for the glitch which meant i have to start in challenge mode and then go to the glitch and do the whole thing again and rather than doing this at night i did it in the morning so that i can keep watch and just move a bit so that i wouldn't time out eventually i got 1 million bolts should have been a very simple thing but somehow it got complicated and then even the story is very simple ratchet's a mechanic and then clank was built in a factory both meet each other become best buds and save planets that's really all there is to it after two games, I decided to go back to more shorter games, starting with the Artful Escape. This is a very short, good music rhythm type game. Just had to go around, play my guitar, light up some lights on the streets, got through it in a couple of hours. 
Omno or Omno was another puzzle game and unlike the other puzzle games I actually played through most of this on my own I didn't have to look up any guides for it except for one puzzle in a later level where I just did not want to spend the time to figure it out and so I looked up a video on it it was really confusing to me but got past it and it's like a puzzle platformer as well and so that makes it I don't know just to me makes it a lot more easier to play and I also had to collect everything but all of the collectibles were visible they weren't hidden away or I had to go out of my way to find them they were just right there on the level and map telling lies is a game i wanted to try out because i'm fascinated by these types of games where they use real people or actors as the narrative or sometimes even gameplay every time i see these types of games i'm like is there really an audience for this and if there is where are they which is very possible maybe i'm just oblivious and ignorant to there being a group of people or community that love these type of games never seen or heard anyone talk about these types of games at all the whole premise is that you're playing a character who's on the screen the entire time from i think midnight all the way until like five or six in the morning and you're just watching videos that's how you play the game and just learn what's going on with all these people and i sort of kind of lost interest halfway through so it's not i mean i guess it is a game but it's also really not you're just watching a ton of videos on these people or maybe it's a passion project but for me it was all right the gardens between is another puzzle game and i would recommend people play this game it's actually a really fun and unique puzzle game where you're controlling two kids and in order to solve every puzzle and every level you're in this dreamscape kind of world and plane and and you're going through both of their experiences some require both use at the same time and some require them to be separated and even some time stopping as well and so go out of your way to play this game it's worth playing for free if you have ps plus i'm not sure if it's still available for free on ps plus if it's not then go buy it on the store when it's on sale or if there's a physical copy go buy it because it's worth your money and time <laughs> Finally getting to a Yakuza game. I've been a fan of this series since getting Yakuza 4 on the PS3. The game was on sale for $20 at the time and I pretty much liked the world of Kamurocho once I was able to play as Akiyama. I plan on getting every Yakuza or like a Dragon Platinum trophy. Ideally I would have loved to get them in their release orders but I don't have all the games right now so I'll just have to get all of them out of order starting with Yakuza Kiwami. All the Yakuza games have a completion list and for most of the games I have to complete every single thing on the list in order to get the platinum trophy. The adventure list isn't too hard it's more of a grind which would be the ongoing trend for most of the games having to do a certain thing you would normally do but not just do it a bunch of times like talking to 300 people. You can talk to the same person over and over again so I just kept pressing X on a random person I chose to speak to 300 times. Eating at all restaurants and dining at them 100 times is self-explanatory. It's better if you have a lot of money to just spend and go to every single restaurant to eat the entire menu and then repeat until you have all of them. Same thing with eating 30 food and medicine items. Once I had all the money to spend, I got a bunch of toughness Z, stamina X, ramen, and water. Taking a taxi 30 times is a really good way to get around the city if you don't want to waste time walking or running on foot. And then traveling on foot by dashing or walking normally is also needed. This should come naturally as long as you look around Kamurocho. I didn't want to actively do this during premium adventure mode and doing laps around the city. So I always had these two in the back of my head just to walk around areas that I wouldn't normally have been there but there might be an item there. Earning 10 million yen is easy through a method that I'll get to later on. Opening coin lockers is easy using a guide or having the locker radar which makes a sound if I was near a locker key. I never used this because it was easier to use a guide to show and tell me where exactly the key was. And entertaining yourself 100 times comes from mostly the mini games. The battle list is about defeating enemies in the different styles, the Colosseum, and weapons. 200 enemies for each of the styles. Brawler is sort of the default style. It's not great nor is it bad. It's a good style to start with and depending on your taste, you could stick with it or move on to the others. I stuck with it because it didn't have any big drawbacks to it. Rush style is more of what I like. It's super fast and I was able to dodge mid combo if I saw an enemy about to hit me. And it's super cheap if you know how to use it right. Beast style is not really my thing mainly because it's super 
slow. I've seen speedruns of Kiwami and Zero and B style pretty much dominated a good amount of the run because of how powerful it can be by hitting harder and it covers a wider range of attacks along with automatically picking up a weapon whenever you start attacking. So while there's a good amount of benefits to using this style, the slow part is what kills it for me. Sort of have to commit once you start attacking. And then Dragon style. I didn't use a whole lot because it sucked early on. I had to beat Majima for a good amount of the moves and learn all the Komaki moves which the only reason to do so was Tiger Drop, arguably the most powerful and OP move in all the games. But even after getting this, I don't really use Dragon style. The only time I used it was during the boss fights in Majima and the only move that I would use was of course Tiger Drop. There are other moves to use but Tiger Drop just makes everything better. Since I needed to defeat 200 enemies for each style, defeating 500 enemies and helping 30 people around the city both came naturally as well as defeating 10 Nuvo and 1 Kiwami enemy. The Nuvo enemies are wearing gold and they don't spawn in too often so if I saw one then I would drop whatever I was doing and go fight them. Same thing for the Kiwami guy who luckily I just got when I was farming enemies. Breaking and defeating 100 enemies with objects or weapons was sort of the only one I had to actively go out and do. At no point in the game I thought of picking up a weapon. Using brawler and rush style was enough for me. Getting 100 weapons and 70 gear items wasn't an issue. A lot of it is tied to sub stories and a good amount of them can be bought from the pawn shops or other shops that only sell weapons and gear. Using 300 heat actions and 40 different types of heat actions I got when I was using each style. Most of my fights already ended in a heat move even if it was a waste. I still use the heat move because it was cool to always use one. The Colosseum is an underground tournament where you partake in fights. It gets introduced in chapter 5 and the list wants me to win 50 fights and fight all 25 opponents. The Colosseum doesn't do much for me, it's more fighting and that's really it. It gets repetitive real fast and by the time I got around 20 wins, I was getting bored. But this is one of the better ways of earning a lot of money. The other way is getting the Ibusu socks and you earn money by walking around the city. I didn't want to spend hours or even more running around to get a million or so yen. So the Colosseum is the other way. Way. Having a lot of money just helps out a lot. I can spend without having to worry about how much I'm spending. So I won't be talking about every single sub story because some of them I thought were okay or I just have nothing to say about them and I'm only going to talk about the ones I like. The Price of an F Cup is a scam sub story where Kiryu helps a woman and after helping her, she offers you to go to a bar for a drink and while I initially said yes, the more she was persistent in having me drink, I was more suspicious of her and the bartender and I said no every time it was offered. The bartender gets fed up and I have to beat him up in his guise and then he gives us access to the secret casino at the ramen place. This isn't the only sub story involving a scam. There is the molestation one, palm reader, debt collection, bump and scam, and there's three or four sub stories dedicated to just bumping into the same people and doing the same trick. There's one about contacts, the brother and sister scam. There's too many of them. And the reason why I only liked the first one was because Kiryu was doing a nice thing, which turned out to be a scam and it led to the casino. The others were obviously a scam and there was no swerve at the beginning. Haruka recognizes a boxer as she's a boxing fan. The boxer is Jako Yagisawa. He doesn't treat Haruka that well, which means I gotta beat him up and then ask him why he's in a bad mood. Turns out he has to throw his championship match, the one he's been fighting for, and he's told to throw it because he messed up a Yakuza member and the news made it to people who can make his life worse. So Kiryu decides to help him out and beat up the guy who wants him to throw that match. And now Jako can win the fight without having to worry about any sort of consequences. Doing this made Haruka happy, even though she heard about throwing the match she still wanted to believe that he would win so it meant a lot to her that I used the violence to solve the issue. The accuser's wife is short but significant. Kiryu goes back to the beginning of the game where he took the blame and meets Yayoi Dojima who wants revenge and has a group try to kill him but it doesn't work. Yayoi suspects that Kiryu isn't the actual killer and wants to know who he's trying to protect and Kiryu still protects Nishiki and asks Yayoi for a bit of time. Even though it seems that Nishiki is a completely different person, Kiryu still wants to believe that he did the right thing taking the blame and at the end she drops down and cries. She's waited 10 years to find her husband's murder and just wants closure closure on the situation. A doctor's duty has Kiryu meeting a boy who is all alone and wants food because he's hungry. Kiryu meets the same boy again and asks for food again. And the boy is always alone because he's waiting for his mom who works very late hours. But it doesn't seem like she's coming to get him. The boy knocks out and I have to take him to the Emoto clinic. Kiryu has a fight with foreigners because they think Emoto left their friend to die but he's fine. The boy is treated but the mom is nowhere to be seen. The mom is either working as a hostess which explains why he's alone at night or mom just left him. If she is working and leaving him alone, why 
why not just have him stay home so that he doesn't catch a cold or get kidnapped? And I thought of the mom leaving him because I never saw her. Maybe she thought the solution of taking care and feeding her son was to leave him, but can you save the boy's life? The Korean game wanted me to get prizes for Sasaki because he sucks at it and really wants certain prizes for his kid. And since I already like playing the minigame, this was an easy and fun sub story. He has a run in with a Yakuza member. And then after beating him, Sasaki gives a locker key. But I don't care about that. I was able to help a father get prizes for his kid, which is all that really matters. Kiryu pretends to be Kenji, whose father is looking for him, and Kiryu plays along with it, meets Tatsu who's currently taking care of the old man named Jin, and Kiryu has to deal with some homeless hunters who go around and beat on homeless people because they have nothing else better to do I guess. After this, Tatsu knows that Kiryu isn't Kenji and tells what's going on. Kenji was a medic for the war and he hasn't come back yet. Jin is still waiting for Kenji to come back home but probably knows that he died and when he saw Kiryu who looks like Kenji, he thought his son came back. Kiryu pretending to be him gave Jin one last moment to spend time with his son. What started from a mystique and lying turned into a real sad story. Sub stories number 30 to 33 revolve around an apprentice named Kano who really wants to be a Yakuza. The first thing he does is challenge a fight to Kiryu and gets his ass kicked and then wants Kiryu to train him to become a Yakuza. And all of these sub stories is just him failing miserably at being one. The last one is reality check where Kano was forced to draw out Kiryu so that other Yakuza members can beat him. Kano after this finally realizes that he's not cut out for the Yakuza life lifestyle and rather than putting his life in danger, Kiryu decides to save it and tells him to get out. The cell phone plan is a good mystery. Kiryu comes across a dead body and sees two other guys freak out from it. A cell phone rings from the dead body and of course Kiryu picks it up. It leads to locker keys where he finds a dagger and the caller wants Kiryu to kill a certain someone and that person is Kiryu himself. Kiryu just so happens to find the assassin who was hired to kill him. A Tojo clan member hired him to kill Kiryu but the fungi doesn't know the details. Kiryu is still left wondering. Love that it starts out as a mystery and still ends as a mystery. Memories of the Bubble is just a callback to Yakuza 0. There's an actress named Aya and she has a upcoming role where she's dancing in a disco club and wants to know what it was like dancing during the 80s and Kiryu just so happens to have lived through the decade and tells her about how the economy was great, everyone was throwing money around as if it was nothing and this honestly just made me want to go back and play Yakuza 0. Kiryu tells her all that she needs to know and dances in the club as if it was the 80s again and catches the eye of a director who's also looking for someone to play in his next project called Disco Queen of Love and Aya is perfect for the role. As a sub story, it wasn't all too important, but because it was basically a love letter to Yakuza 0, I loved it. Behind the assassin gives backstory to the inmate that attacked Kiryu when he was in prison. Kiryu meets him again, of course, both fight, and the inmate wants to move on from the Yakuza stuff entirely. After going through what feels like unnecessary fighting, it turns out the inmate was a pawn sent in by Chairman Sarah. Sarah wanted to keep Kiryu safe, so what better way than having him beat an inmate or multiple inmates to prove that no one should be messing with Kiryu, and this made Kiryu's prison time so much easier. He could have been fighting an inmate or a bunch multiple times a day, so in retrospect, it made the prison scenes mean a lot more. And then the Amon fight which wasn't too bad. I failed a couple of times because I was too impatient so as long as I was spamming a bunch of heat moves at the beginning and then waited for the right moment to do tiger drop during his last date then it was fine. I love that it breaks a fourth wall when Joe asks if we know him and both characters just look at us and Kiri talks about fighting the same guy about 20 years ago. It doesn't go into who Joe is and I don't care. I see him as a final boss for completing all the sub stars so I don't need to know why he wants to fight Kiri or why he even shows up in every game. Just want to beat him get a trophy and then move on. Mm -hmm. Majima Everywhere is essentially the Mr. Shakedown mechanic from Yakuza 0. The only difference is that rather than getting a lot of money, you earn dragon style moves when Majima is defeated. It's just fun seeing Majima pop up from a manhole or a building or even as a stripper. You can't escape for him. At the beginning, it was obviously a lot harder, but once you learn Tiger Drop, it's game over for Majima. Defeating him 50 times wasn't an issue because he comes out as different styles from Zero. I was either facing the Thug, Slugger, Breaker, or Mad Dog style. There's even a surprise or force attacks by him, the stripper area, traffic cones, or just jumping down from a building. Playing 5 minigames with him was also another fun thing to do and all 5 were bowling because bowling is easy in most of the games. So Majima Everywhere is a great addition to this game. The minigames are usually the thing I look forward to the least because there's one or two minigames that I don't enjoy playing. Club Asia I didn't know was required for playing every single minigame and the minigame is just a strip show. I could change seats but I don't really see it as a minigame but I guess it is and it's okay. 
Mesu King is a lesser version of the cat minigame in Zero. It's just paper, rock, scissors, and if I win that, then my characters get to attack. I don't like this one because it is 100% RNG based. There's not any way to actually be good in the game. I just had to be lucky. There were some stories tied to this, so I had to finish out the sub stories, which meant playing more of the minigame. However, the RNG doesn't seem as bad as it is in Yakuza Zero. <laughs> Pocket Circuit is my favorite minigame and sub story. The sub story is probably the longest one, which can be an issue, but it's not because I got to race with little carts and had rivals I had to beat for a good chunk of the sub stories, and I got to customize my cart with better parts in different colors. And honestly, this minigame can be its own game if there were more parts and content added to it. There were some tracks that I thought were difficult and looked up guides on, but even getting stuck on some races, I still have fun going through it. It's been 17 years since Kiryu and Pocket Circuit Fighter last met, and he has the sad news of having to leave his job to work at his parents tofu shop and now he needs to find a replacement and throughout this sub story both him and Kyu try to find the next person to replace him and of course it goes back to those kids in Yakuza 0 they're now grown adults they have like lives now and have jobs after racing a whole bunch Takuma will be the one to replace pocket circuit fighter because he's the one that's always been thinking about this place as his main source of income and job and that's what makes him happy so pocket circuit fighter can move on UFO Catcher is a staple minigame by this point in the series. I like it because it's a simple minigame that doesn't ask a lot. I only needed 15 prizes for the completion list. The Cabaret Club is listed as a minigame even though you don't actually play it like you do in Zero or Kiwami 2. It's tied to two sub stories that involve the hostesses and I don't really remember their sub stories so this one was forgettable and alright. The phone booth minigame is another simple one where I had to take 10 best shots. There are of course the casino minigames, poker, blackjack, baccarat, and roulette. I like all of them except roulette. Even though all of these are RNG minigames, I've never liked roulette and I think it's because of how long it takes for the roulette wheel to finish moving before it comes to a complete stop. I have to pray that the ball lands on the number I was betting on even though I know it's going to take a while to make some money and chips for it. Blackjack is my favorite because it's the easiest one for me to get into and quickly get chips for it. The gambling hall is where the Japanese gambling games are played. Chohan is a 50-50 betting game. You bet on either odd or even on where the dice will land on. And if I was right, then I got all the chips that the others are betting on. Silo is where I had to bet on what the dices were going to land on in this bowl that was being thrown by either me or the other players. That's what I took away from it. And like with the other gambling mini games, pray that I won with my bets. Koi Koi is a card game. And I still don't really know how to play the game or know what causes cards to have more points. Combine cards to get points and either call koi or don't if you want more points the only times when i called koi was when i wanted more than one point and as long as i had a multiplier to have at least 14 points then i didn't call koi and move on to the next round and then orjo kabu was the one where i had to get close or exactly nine points from my cards in order to beat the other players all of these gambling mini games will come back for pretty much every game which makes it easier when i eventually platinum the other games but also know that i'm gonna have to endure a bit of rng bs <laughs> darts is fun but so much better in the dragon engine games all the darts minigame before are a bit frustrating because you can't tell where your dart is going to land once i pull back to initiate me throwing the dart you have to aim with the tip of the dart and then when you throw lightly let go of the right stick to get a more accurate shot and thank god the requirements are only getting 10 hat tricks if i had to play the other types of dart minigame probably maybe a couple of hours on darts I enjoy playing pool. Most of the time, I just recklessly shoot the ball and hope another one makes it into the hole. I didn't have to beat the hardest difficulty or anything like that. I had to get three combination shots and three carom shots, which I don't know what it was. It's basically hitting two balls and getting both in the hole. I had to set them up constantly by getting a foul so that I can get two balls at the edge and then hit both at the same time. <laughs> For the batting center, I had to get 1,600 points for all the difficulties and hit two panels at the same time. Very straightforward, nothing too hard about it. Like with darts, the batting minigame gets better in the later games. There's a better indication on when I hit the ball to get a home run shot, which makes it a lot more fun to play. <laughs> Yikes. 
Bowling has always been easy. Back when I was playing Yakuza 4 on the PS3, I remember looking up a video on how to get a strike all the time. And the method was to go to a corner and aim exactly diagonally and then go to the maximum power with no turning at all and you would get a strike. And this still works even in later games. There might be some instances where I didn't land a strike because of one pin and it's always one pin. I was only required to get 10 strikes and a total of 5 points in a split game. I never learned to play Shogi and I never will because there are videos on how to win a game without a take back. I only needed 5 take backs and then I just moved on. Would it benefit me to actually learn how to play Shogi? Yes, but I just don't want to. Manjon is the reason why this game took forever to complete. The minigame itself I like, but it's the requirements that make me despise it. Getting a full straight seems impossible because of the RNG. There were even moments where I was close to getting it and then one other player got a sumo. Or if it wasn't that, it was just my tiles and I didn't get the right ones. Unless you're super lucky, then expect to play this game for about a full day or even longer. It took me a full day to get a full straight. And then the last minigame is probably the most well-known one because of the out of context clips that are on Twitter and just everywhere and it's mainly due to one song. Everyone knows about this song, whether it was through a meme or playing the games, karaoke is always going to be part of the series. It's one of the many times where you can take a break from the story and cool down with a great song, or even when you decide to get off the game, you can close it out with a song. Getting 100 points for all the songs was easy enough, but I do like the Dragon Engine version better because you can see all the input that you need to press rather than waiting for the next line to pop up and not knowing whether or not it's fast or slow. <laughs> The climax battles is an extra mode that allows you to go through the boss fights in a boss rush or most of the time there's a certain objective that needs to be fulfilled within a certain amount of time. Most were easy to do even 10 where I had to play as Dante. Dante has very limited skill set, not very good. It's still doable, I did fail a couple of times but it was just a matter of trial and error and deciding who to take out first. The legend run was easy with all my stats and upgrades carrying over. All the bosses were easy to deal with, but there is one section where most people will probably have a lot of trouble with, which is the car section. Legend difficulty has a rule. If I were to die, that means I would have to restart from a last save. The way you get to the car section is by fighting through a bunch of dudes and then fighting Lao Ka Long, and then by this point, finally reaching the car section, and there is no save point between these fights, aside for the very beginning. So if I fail the car section, that would mean I would have to redo all those fights. So what I did to prevent this was searching up a video and there were five videos that popped up and I used this one where this person was able to show when and where to shoot certain enemies, watched the video a bunch of times to memorize it and then when it came time to the part I got through it in one try. It would suck having to go back just to get to that one part. Yakuza Kiwami first takes place in 1995. Kiryu still has the people who he considers family. Nishiki, who's a longtime friend he met at an orphanage. His father Kazuma and another longtime friend Yumi, who he has a crush on but doesn't have the courage to tell her yet. It's a very normal day for all of them until Nishiki shoots and kills a Tojo Patriarch member for making moves on Yumi. Kiryu being the great person that he is, tells both to run and he'll take the blame. 10 years pass by and now it's 2005 where things are different and when he gets back out, 10 billion yen that has gone missing from the Tojo clan. Kiryu has to catch up on what's been going on since 1995 and is in the middle of the 10 billion yen situation. Some of the notable people that are looking for the money are Shimano, Lao Kao Long, who has a very annoying boss fight. Every time he switches his weapons, he probably has armor and I'll have to wait until he's done attacking, which is why Tiger Drop is your best friend for most of the boss fights. Jingu is the guy that's been stealing money from the clan to make his own income and now wants to take back that money that he originally stole. His boss fight is also not the most fun. If you don't know what you're doing, then good luck. Hopefully you have a ton of health, dodge as many bullets as you can because two MIA agents also show up and have guns and it's just so much fun trying to avoid getting shot. And then there are other people and groups that are looking for the money, but I don't care about them, except for Manjima. He's looking for the money, but what he's really after is Kiryu. Along with the Manjima Everywhere mechanic, he finds any chance to have a one-on-one -on -one time with Kiryu. Even though it feels redundant, I was already fighting him a bunch of times, and then there's the story-related fights, but I also can't say no to Manjima. He doesn't play any major role in the story, he's there to inconvenience Kiryu. 
Sierra, Kazuma, and Yumi were the ones who stole the money because they had found out about Jingu stealing it, and rather than being out in the open, all three just sort of went away and disappeared for a while. <laughs> Haruka is also in the same position as Kiryu. She's in the middle of the 10 billion yen and all she wants to do is find her mother. So Kiryu helps her with that while also slowly becoming her father because apparently her father is Jingu and he just doesn't care about her at all. And her mother turns out to be Yumi so it all works out with Kiryu looking for her as well. And Haruka is the reason why Kiryu decides to keep on living after the events of this game. <laughs> Dante is a former cop who's looking for Chairman Sira, and just like with Haruka, becomes more of a friend and eventually a family member. Dante was banned from the force after investigating a detective and found out that he was exchanging info for bribes. Dante lost all respect for not only that detective but the entire force and now does solo investigations. He's the one to also convince Kiryu decides to stay with Haruka because he could rebuild an entirely new family just with him and her. He has changed a lot since Kiryu went to prison. He seems to have made it to the top of the Tojo clan. Doesn't really help Kiryu, gives him these dirty ass looks. While Kiryu was in prison, you would think Nishiki would be fine, but things just got worse for him. He had to live with the fact that Kiryu took the blame and now Tojo clan members don't see him in a good light and probably won't be able to be part of it anymore. He can't keep his men in line because they don't respect him and everyone keeps making comparisons of him to Kiryu and making him feel useless and inferior to Kiryu. His sister died and the doctor that needed 30 million yen, completely lied to him, he has no one to go to and all of these things just keep happening until he breaks. The one guy that was giving him no respect pays the price and Nishiki decides to become his own man and get out from Kiryu's shadow. And he truly became his own man at the end. Rather than let Kiryu save him again, Nishiki sacrifices himself in order to pay back for the 10 years Kiryu spent in prison and be the one to stop Jingu, causing an explosion at the top of the Millennium Tower. Nishiki finally felt that he was useful at that moment. Kiryu lost everyone he considered family. Kazama got shot and despite telling him that he killed his biological parents, Kiryu doesn't care because Kazama filled that void of being his father. Yumi died because of Jingu. He was able to finally get with her and with Haruka being her daughter, it would have been the perfect family to lead another life but it was cut short. And then losing Nishiki, seeing him change and being able to have him back at the end just for a bit and then he had to go and self-sacrifice. Kiryu has no reason to live anymore but with the influence from Date, Haruka would be his way out from the Yakuza life. He does doesn't want to be the chairman anymore and realizes that it's gonna be a lot safer getting out and starting a new life with Haruka. Yakuza 6 The Song of Life is so much easier compared to Kiwami. A big part of this was the fact that I didn't need a 100% the completion list. Out of the 285 things to do, I only needed 100 things to do. This is also the first game with the Dragon Engine and of course there's going to be some differences. Everything is voiced in this game including all sub stories. It doesn't have the text box show up at any point and while this is great, this time could have been used somewhere else like the heat moves. The one heat move that I used throughout most of my playthrough was Heat Rush. When I activate extreme heat mode and start punching people, it will prompt a QTE, having Kiryu just constantly punch the hell out of the enemy. And the reason for this is because there's no ground heat action. I can't go up to an enemy that's on the ground and then just use a heat move. I don't know if this was just forgotten about, but it really suck not being able to do that. The combat at the start is very slow and while it gets better with upgrades, Kiryu just doesn't have his known dragon style moves. I don't think it's bad but if this was going to be Kiryu's last game which now it clearly isn't, maybe changing up his combat wasn't the best idea. I do like the way getting XP and upgrades work. There are different types of upgrades that are colored, reddish for strength, blues for agility, yellows for spirit, green for technique, and purple for charm. Depending after what sub story or boss fight you do, there's usually a big amount of XP you get. I do like the upgrades from Yakuza 4 and 5 with the soul upgrades, but something about having to decide where to put your upgrades to each of the colors I think is also another good upgrading system. And this is minor, but being able to walk into M store or any store that can be walked into without a loading screen is great. Just being able to walk in, buy some food items or whatever and then walk back out is a great quality of life change. 
since I didn't need to do everything, most of the things that I did were minigames, clan creator, and sub stories. The one missable trophy was the baby minigame, which I didn't realize was a minigame because there's only one time where this can occur, and it's when you're at Onomichi where Haruto can wake up and I had to put him to sleep by either swinging or lifting him to put him back to sleep. It's alright, and it doesn't last too long, but he will wake back up if you don't do the objective really quickly. So just get through this quickly and then just complete whatever it is that you need to do. Fantasy Zone was alright. I played this airplane or flying character where I had to shoot other things that were moving and get the highest score and change your weapons to put the store and fight a boss after doing certain things. I always make it to the first boss fight and then pretty much die afterwards because the list doesn't require much of me to do and I'm not interested in playing any more beyond the first boss fight. Outrun is really fun. I remember playing this in Yakuza 0 and having a hard time with it and when it came time to playing it this time, it wasn't as difficult as it was in 0. I think I knew what I was expecting so all the failures I had in 0 prepared me to get at least 3 million points. As long as you're in high gear the whole time and not crashing a single time, then you're most likely to pass 3 million points. I didn't play Puyo Puyo which would be a mistake on my part in a future game. Welcome to the fan. Space Harrier is also another really fun game. It was a fast paced rail shooter that required 2 million points. The game wanted me to make choices real fast so that I wouldn't get hit and once I got 2 million points then I just kill myself. I do pretty much the bare minimum because these games already take over I don't know 40, 80, 100 hours even. So I'm not going to try to get like the highest score ever. Once I reach the requirements I move on. Super Hang On is like Outrun, but now I was on a motorcycle and needed 4 million points. In terms of difficulty, it's probably about the same as Outrun. Played it in zero, struggled with it, and then it paid off when I played it again. And then the last arcade game was Virtua Fighter 5 Final Showdown. I'm not too familiar with the Virtua Fighter series. The only one that I know of is Virtua Fighter 5 Ultimate Showdown because it uses the Dragon Engine. I don't know the differences between Final or Ultimate Showdown aside from graphics and maybe the online wasn't as good. But playing Final Showdown, I enjoyed it. It's probably the only fighting game that is purely a fighting game. There's no fatalities, rage arts, or smash ball. You just fight. Which is nice that there's a fighting game out there that's just pure. But I also think it might be the reason why it doesn't have a big audience, at least in the US. It doesn't do anything flashy to gravitate towards a casual audience. I've never heard anyone talk about this series and the only reason I even know it is through Yakuza. Which is great that RGG can put a bunch of Sega games that Sega doesn't seem too interested in. They like to pretend that Yakuza and Sonic are the only games they have access to. But now after the game awards, they are making and using their other games now. Some of the minigames are returning ones like the batting center darts which is now great. I don't have to use the tip of the dart to aim. There's now a meter on when you throw the dart. Karaoke of course is back. Monjon which I didn't touch at all because I didn't want to deal with RNG. The rest of the minigames were new. Bar chat was boring. I had to go to a bar and befriend the people who are always there. And after one session, I looked up a guide because there were answers that was the correct one. And since I'm already not interested in what they're already saying, a guide helped me get past the minigame relatively quick. And there are some sub stories tied to it, so I did all of them. There was a baseball minigame where I could recruit people to my team, train them by having them play a full game, or using an item to quickly level them up. And the minigame itself was okay. I wanted it to end as quickly as possible. It's not an in-person baseball game, it's like this board game baseball game. It was just alright. Cat Cafe I didn't realize was a minigame. I just fed cats food and then their level or friendship level thing would just level up. Again, it was just okay. Live Chat is a minigame made for very lonely people who are in a parasocial relationship with the girls they were talking to. I was tasked with successfully chatting with both girls and had 30 successful chat entries. This was another okay minigame. My first initial reaction was this should be fun, but the more I went along, the more I lost interest in it. Rizap or the gym minigame in theory and on paper should sound like a good and fun minigame where Kiri easily lifts like a thousand pounds or something like that but instead it was Kiri working out normally and struggling with it. Like with most of the new minigames it was boring or in this case it should have been more of a ridiculous minigame. Hey, uh 
And the last one is spear fishing, which is the best one because it's essentially a rail shooter done underground and I had to catch a bunch of fish and beat a final boss for each of the stages. It's not too surprising that I like this one because this is a type of game that Sega likes making back in the arcades, which is an arcade rail shooter. And I got a good amount of money, but it isn't the best way to make money. All the new mini games except for spear fishing, I didn't like at all. They replaced prior mini games that were better. The clan creator minigame has its own section because it has a story after beating bosses. This was also okay and I thought I would just play it for a bit and then move on but no. There are two reasons why I had to win all missions. The first reason was that there was a trophy for completing all the missions and the second being that it's the best way to make money. So whether I liked it or not, I went through the entire story of the clan creator and got a good amount of money. A lot of the sub stories I didn't like or care for. A good chunk was the new mini games and I didn't like any of them. There's a new snake flower triad leader and that story felt kind of flat. Kiri comes across a Haruka fan and it was alright. Chasing the drone and cleaning robots didn't do much for me. There's one about cats which I forgot about. There were only a few that I actually liked. Sub story 6 was the one about the YouTuber where this kid wants his 15 minutes of fame by doing anything. Tries interviewing Yakuza members and sees Kiryu's and fails. The kid then gets involved with other Yakuza members and is hanged upside down and even then he thinks it's awesome and doesn't want to delete the video because it'll get so many views and likes. Kiryu even gave him a chance to get out and stop it but sometimes some people are stuck in their way and refuse to change. Pocket Circuit Fighter is back and it was nice seeing him again but he doesn't seem to be happy. He's working at his parents tofu shop and has a son now but they're not really close to each other because his wife thinks that he's a bad influence on their own son which means he's not allowed to be himself and help his son like he did to Kiryu and the other Pocket Circuit kids. His son clearly wants to know more about him and ask Kiryu about what he was like. This all leads to the fighter putting back on the suit and fighting alongside with Kiryu and being a hero to his own son. Tells his wife that he wants to spend more time with his son and needs to be more of himself and the wife accepts. Pocket Circuit Fighter at least now can live a happy life, spend time with his son, which is what makes him the most happy. I like the curse of Onomichi because ghosts were involved. Kiryu comes across a graveyard and he sees a ghost and fights it because it's what you normally do whenever you see a ghost. Every time he wakes up on his back at the graveyard, he meets a gravekeeper and says that the ghosts were his ancestors who were pirates and mercenaries and has been fighting a way to cleanse the graveyard and wants Kiryu to cleanse it by constantly fighting them for about 3 or 4 times and the graveyard has been cleansed. Kiryu talks to the gravekeeper one last time, but then it turns out that the gravekeeper himself was also a ghost. So it ends in a really creepy way and Kiryu just has to live with the fact that he was played by a ghost. And then there were a few sub stories with the Ono Michio. I liked all of it because how can anyone not enjoy being the Ono Michio? This mascot is just great. The Amon fight wasn't difficult at all. I got through it on my first try, although I almost died because of the drones. I was on easy difficulty and I still had trouble putting down Amon because his drones kept on coming in and I had a spam heat rush to put him down. I can't imagine anyone doing this higher than easy. Other than a fun, or not even a fun challenge, just a frustrating challenge on Legend, this fight would be annoying to deal with. Most of the fight is fine, but then once the drones start coming in, then it's not fun anymore to make getting the platinum trophy even easier. There's a known glitch where if you make a manual save right before the last boss fight, you can go back to your manual save, change the difficulty to legend, and beat the final boss again, and the legend difficulty trophy will pop up. It still works in 2023 and doesn't require you to replay the entire game again. <laughs> Yakuza 6 picks up immediately after the events of Yakuza 5 where Kiryu is bleeding out and Haruka is by his side. He's taken to a hospital and Akiyama mentions to Haruka that it probably wasn't a good idea to tell the whole world that her adoptive father is tied to the Yakuza and Tojo clan who prevented another war with the Omi alliance. The police come in to arrest Kiryu because there needs to be consequences for what happened between the Tojo clan and Omi alliance and Kiryu is pretty much a scapegoat so that the public can be at ease. Kiryu's in prison while Haruka and the rest of the kids at the orphanage are on their own. Since Haruka gave her speech, there have been news articles and social media saying that the orphanage is secretly a place to raise Yakuza members and just things that are made up. This causes Haruka to leave and go on her own adventure. Kiryu is released four years later and now has to go find Haruka only to find a baby named Haruto who turns out to be Haruka's child. So he goes to Onomichi with Haruto to find answers. 
So I don't really care about this game's story, and it's mainly because of the new characters that are introduced and how much I don't care about them. By the time I got to the end, I felt absolutely nothing. This was Kiryu's last game, which we all know, it's not. But having new characters come in wasn't doing it for me. Where were Majima, Saijima, Daigo, and other characters that were connected to Kiryu in the past? They were nowhere to be seen. The entirety of the Hirose family, I didn't care about. The game made an effort to make me care, but I just couldn't. Haruka leaving because of comments said about the orphanage sort of goes against her character. I get seeing terrible comments about you or the people that she loves, but she was raised by Kiryu and because she's affiliated with them, she's been through a lot involving Yakuza stuff. So leaving because of some comments and the perception of the orphanage seems like a weak reason for her to leave. <laughs> There's also a mystery surrounding who the father is for Haruto, and the father turns out to be Yuda. His reason for not speaking up and thinking that it was his child was that he and Haruka did it only one time, which is a very lame excuse. How the hell does he not question Haruka if it was his when she brought Haruto along with her? Yuda as a character, he's fine. I don't really care if he comes back or not. <laughs> The main villain, Iwami, I felt nothing about the guy. He burns down Little Asia and probably does something evil and doesn't revert back to being a good person. But you know, he's there. He's the villain, I guess. <laughs> There are things I do like about the story. Ed is a big imposing dude that shows up every now and then to fight Kiryu. That is all he does and it's what he needs to be. <laughs> Akiyama being in the game is always going to be a great thing. Having to fight him in that small ass room because Kiryu is too stubborn was good. And then having him come back at the end to help fight was also great. Somaya is the one villain that stands out because of his ideals and beliefs that contrast to Kiryu's ideals and beliefs. He doesn't believe that having a back tattoo makes you a Yakuza. He thinks it's ridiculous and the tradition should go away. He doesn't have to hurt civilians and working a honest job is a much safer way to be a Yakuza. While Kiryu sees it as a person's ideals and the life that they've chosen to live, it's the one part of the story that I thought was the most interesting. Maybe getting a giant back tattoo while cool isn't what it used to be anymore and there could have been a lot more more there. And then Kiryu leaving everything so that he could keep Haruka and the kids safe was a good end for him if it was truly his last game. A politician comes in and tells Kiryu that he wants him to keep quiet about certain things and rather than keeping the hush money, he wants to be erased from existence. He has Date keep the secret. Kiryu can have what he wants or at least a part of it which is to be left alone. Ever since the second game, he's wanted a way out from the Yakuza lifestyle and there's always something that brings him back and so with him being dead, no one can go looking for him about challenging him or making threats towards the orphanage just kind of wish the journey on getting here was a bit better but it wouldn't matter because he comes back Yakuza Kiwami 2 is just as easy as Yakuza 6. The only difference is that I actually have to complete the completion list this time. The adventure list is mostly the same. Dining out, eating at every restaurant, taking the taxi, earning a lot of money and XP. There are only two things that are new. The first one was the vending machines. They were also in Yakuza 6 but I don't see any use for them other than a little boost stat and it wasn't required to drink all of the drinks. However, in Kiwami 2, not only did I have to drink all the different kinds of drinks but muscle soda is just the most OP thing in the game. Game. It grants me extra damage and especially on the legend run, it makes everything so much easier. First and last encounter with Ryuji was done in maybe a minute or two and every other boss fight also took the same amount of time to beat. Don't know why this was never brought back in the games that came after this but if I were to assume, it's the part about it being way too OP. And then there are a bunch of mystery drinks and it's RNG on which ones you get so just keep on buying and drinking them until you get every single mystery drink. 
And then the second thing on the list was Haruka's request. Most of them were easy. Going to a restaurant to dine there or buy a certain item at a drugstore or M store. The annoying requests were the gambling ones. I plan on saving them for the completion, but since I didn't want to wait for RNG during the request, I knew some of the cheat items. And unlike other games, I can't buy endless cheat items. These are one-time uses. I just use some of it on this request so that later on, I can just deal with the typical RNG stuff with the gambling minigames. Battle list is also mostly the same with defeating enemies, destroying weapons, getting weapons and gear, and heat actions. I needed to activate extreme heat mode 50 times which isn't as good as it was in 6 because I couldn't do heat rush. I thought it was not in this game, but then people found out that there were heat moves that were unlisted and heat rush was a part of that list. So I probably would have had a lot more fun if I knew about these unlisted EX heat moves. Combat feels the same, maybe it's better because RGG had more time to mess with the dragon engine but ground heat actions are back. And that's all that matters to me. And then I also forgot to mention in Yakuza 6, the dynamic intros are great. There's a camera shake, the title comes on screen with usually a Yakuza crest in the middle with a good soundtrack in the background. The bouncer missions are where I just beat up more enemies and it quickly gets repetitive because I had to play the same mission on three different difficulties. It did give me a good amount of money by the end, but it wasn't the best way to earn money. The clan creator is back and it's better in terms of placing exactly where your allies go rather than just hovering over in an area in Yakuza 6. The only issue is that I still don't care about this and now that I have to complete everything, defeating 1000 enemies wasn't particularly the most fun thing to do. I totally spent most of the time starting the game and then going on my phone to pass the time and repeat the process until 1000 were defeated and this is still not the best way to earn money. <laughs> The best way to earn a lot of money was the Cabaret Club. It is back from Yakuza 0 and it's great having to manage hostess and make customers happy, but also taking care of the hostess as well. Once I was able to progress enough through each of the Platinum Hostess sub-stories, I got more customers coming in, filling in all 6 seats to cater to their specific needs and make a profit from it. Extending the sections for most of the time works out and makes you more money, and I never bother with changing the looks of the hostess. It probably does make me more money if I were to change them, but leaving them as they were already made enough money for me. Most of the minigames came back from previous games, darts, all gambling minigames, batting. Golf was a part of the other games but it's different where instead of being outside to play golf, you're inside of a building and each round is a different distance. And there's now the bingo game where I had to hit every single panel to get a bingo and I was allowed for only one mistake and it was a fun challenge to figure out exactly where to hit the golf ball. The video shops are also back from zero. Once again, it's another thing that I didn't think was a minigame but I just had to watch 15 videos and Manjon once again took the longest. It was almost a a full day of going out with Ron or a sumo 30 times. Milky Nose and the North and the Sun are just weird. It's a pissy mini game where I competed with another guy and blast my P to win. Playing it isn't actually fun. I wasn't winning on easy mode so after searching for answers apparently having a full bladder makes it harder for me to fill the gauge to blast my opponent and the number that I wanted my bladder to be was around 1200 to 1700 and after following what was told I got past the easy one and then eventually the normal and hard versions for both mini games. I I don't ever pay attention to the bladder until I need to go out and eat and then when it's full it's time to go out to get beat up and then eat at every single restaurant again. Virtual Fighter 2 was fun to go through all the characters. Same thing for Virtual On, despite the controls, controlling some of the mechs weren't fun but having a mecha 3D arena fighter was really fun. Be My BB is more of what I want from sub stories where you come across weird and ridiculous stuff. Kiri gets invited to a building and he sees grown as men wearing adult diapers and there are caretakers taking care of them. This is honestly a very normal day of playing any Yakuza game. Kiri fights all of them. You get something. I forgot what you get but Kiri just gets in, realizes the mistakes he's made, and beats them up and gets out. The legendary dragon goes around to scare people around Kamurocho and this person isn't Kiryu at all. There's a fake Kiryu going around and using the name to get what he wants. So Kiryu goes up to the fake and punches Kiryu who isn't phased at all by the punch and kicks his ass to stop impersonating him. It's pretty much if you decide to mess around and you'll quickly realize you probably should have done this in the first place. Mr. Try and Hit Me is more of a challenge where I need to hit this guy within 30 seconds. If I fail, then I redo the challenge until I hit him. It's a fun and quick one. 
Rising from the Shadows is my favorite sub story so far. Kiryu is given a videotape from a guy and when Kiryu watches it, it shows a woman at the park on a swing, disappears and then comes up to the camera for a jump scare. The guy who gave you the tape says it's a curse which I'm pretty sure is a nod to the ring or Ringu. You die if you watch a videotape of a girl crawling out of a well. Kiryu then meets this exorcist guy who claims to cleanse the curse of the videotape turns out to be a scam but he starts seeing this woman from the tape and wants out. Kiryu was also seeing the woman at the end and she starts to come up to him but Kiryu drops the tape and this probably saved his life. I don't know what she had in mind but it probably wasn't anything good because the previous guy was so happy about passing it on to Kiryu. Because of how creepy the whole sub story was, this is my favorite sub story. Welcome to the Modern Age involves Date and not being able to get the internet working. It's hilarious seeing Kiryu and Date not getting how the internet works and thinks that that guy selling them on this internet thing is a scam, which turned out to be true. This guy was scamming older people who didn't understand what the internet was. After beating this guy up, Kiryu calls Date about how the internet is a scam and not real, but Date actually got the internet working and the internet would be the main way of getting information in the Modern Age. All good, bad, and even fake information. Linear Claw is another UFO catcher sub story where I needed to help a father get prizes for his kid. It's like the one in Kiwami, but I enjoyed the minigame, so I didn't mind it. The main reason why I liked overwhelming affluence was Virtua Fighter 2. Kiryu bumps into Kane Matsu and he doesn't shy away from showing off his wealth. Challenges Kiryu to Virtua Fighter 2, beat him easily. Later on you see him talking to another man and claims to have been threatened by Kane Matsu over a company or something like that. Kane Matsu then wants to invest in Kamurocho Hills. Some time passes and he's broke. Investing in the hills wasn't the best idea and asked Kiryu back the 100k that he gave him and he has himself to blame for throwing away cash but despite this i gave back the 100k because it was better to show kindness even though he's probably gonna repeat the same mistakes etsuko is back and looks pretty much the same she was already old in yakuza 0 and was one of the better hostesses to make money for the cabaret club she's been accused of stealing from a store there's a back and forth and then it turns ugly when a knife gets brought out kiryu steps in and saves etsuko and she can't control herself kiryu reminds her of majima and jumps onto kiryu and has her way with them leaving kiryu speechless on how strong she is this one was just fun and the fact that she hasn't aged at all like how does she not have gray hairs or i don't I don't know how she looks the same but she has her way of making herself look the same and is somehow really strong. Crazy for Kathy is about a guy who loves his car so much that he names it Kathy and thinks Kiryu somehow messed with it. He sounds insane. Kiryu kicks his ass and the sub story ends. The only reason I liked it was because it reminded me of My Strange Addiction, a show where people have strange addictions and I think one of them was a person getting engaged with a train and this guy in Kiwami 2 is doing the same thing but with a car. Clearing the fog is another funny one where Kiryu meets a man who has a bad memory and to get his memory back I decided to kick his ass but the guy doesn't want you kicking his ass. There's a high voltage stun gun around you and the guy has his memories back and what he needed to remember was killing Kiryu for 10 million yen so now I actually have to kick his ass again and his memory is all messed up and Kiryu decides to leave him alone as he doesn't want a hitman coming after him. Yakuza Sunset is an interesting one because it can mean a lot of different things. Kiryu meets a film director Sugano and he's having trouble with third sunset movie the original director left and now it's up to him to direct it and he fears that he's not qualified for the job the first two movies were so good that there's no way the third one can live up to it the action scenes might not be as good this sub story could be a nod to movie trilogies where the third movie just drops the ball to complete the trilogy or maybe even yakuza 3 one of the biggest criticisms was the combat in 3 so maybe it's rgg poking fun at themselves or maybe it's an inside joke that the developers only know and put in here just for them or maybe i'm just looking way into this and this director can't live up to the other director that's all it's about who knows Kiryu tells Sugano to make whatever he wants and if the fans see the attention to detail and passion then that's all that really matters Akagi's challenge was a golf sub story and since I already like golf and it's fun this one by default I already like and then there was obviously an Amon fight, but rather than just fight Joe, I had to fight three other members of the Amon family. Kazuya Amon was dual wielding axes, Jiro Amon has a gun and grenades which look really annoying to deal with, Sango Amon has a rocket launcher which by default makes him annoying to fight, and then Joe Amon starts off with a photon blade and then adds another one later in the fight. Now all of these would be challenging, but there's muscle soda and this drink makes all these fights easy. All of them together on the last bouncer mission was a lot harder because one is throwing grenades, one is throwing rocket launchers while the other two are trying to swing at you. This was the easiest Amon fight so far. Ryu 
Yuji Goda is part of the Omi Alliance and he also has a dragon tattoo on his back and wants to see who's better, him or Kiryu. And that's pretty much his main motivation in this game, which is why I think he's a very dull character. Even the reveal of him being a half-brother to Sayama didn't really do much for me. I'm not gonna think about him when I think back on Kiwami 2. Well, that's a lie because when I think of a scattered moment, I'll be thinking about Ryuji and Kiryu bumping into each other's heads. But as a villain, I don't think he's great. He has a simple motivation and that's all he does throughout this game. Making Kiryu's life harder, or well, I guess until the end. I don't think he even cares about the war. He just wants to fight Kiryu. Kiwami 2 starts off with the 5th Chairman Tarada trying to prevent the war between the Tojo clan and the Omi Alliance. And he decides to go talk to Kiryu and get him back involved with the whole situation. Even though Kiryu's made it very clear he wants out. But Tarada gets shot and dies which forces Kiryu to get back involved with the Tojo clan once again. Kiryu searches for a person to be the next chairman and that person is Daigo Dojima. And I still don't know exactly why Kiryu chose Daigo. Kiryu said he was charismatic and had the strength of his father. Kiryu basically backed him up even though Daigo was at a club drinking and smoking and seems to have no direction in his life. Daigo is the Yoi's son. She's the temporary chairman. And if I had to guess, Kiryu chose Daigo to make up for Nishiki killing his father. Daigo goes through his own journey of getting it together and eventually becoming the sixth chairman. A third party gets involved and they are the Jingwian Mafia. It's tied to Kiryu through Kazuma. A long time ago, Kazuma and Shimano were ordered to take out the Jingwian Mafia because at the time, the Tojo clan wanted to be on top so they got rid of the competition. Little did they know, there were three survivors of the massacre and at least two of them slowly infiltrated within the Tojo clan to get their revenge. One of the survivors was Tarada himself. He faked his own death to cause a domino effect of having the Omi Alliance and Tojo clan fight and destroy each other. The Jingwian Mafia is also what keeps Kiryu in the story because he could just find Daigo, see him become the 6th chairman and then just leave. He has no reason to stay and could just leave Daigo to deal with the war. But since Kiryu was there during the massacre, just like making up for Nishiki killing Daigo's father, Kiryu wants to make it up for Sayama whose parents were killed during the massacre. Sayama is a detective and her job is just to protect Kiryu from getting killed as his death will lead to an all out war. But she has more of an interest with the Tojo clan since her parents were killed in the massacre. She too is a survivor. She was just a baby at the time and wanted to find out why her parents had to die. It was greed and power. Kiryu tells her that he was there and she's pissed at him. No matter how much Kiryu wants to get out, there is something that connects him to current events and it's usually nothing good and involves a lot of people dying. She's also the next love interest for Kiryu as well and while I don't care about this, it's sort of the natural progression for Kiryu. He still has Haruka around and doesn't serve much of a purpose aside from getting taken hostage. But Kiryu has to realize that being a single parent has to be hard and having Sayama in his life wouldn't be a bad thing as it would help with the parent duties and Haruka could have a mother and father as well. Then I want to mention Shindo not because I like the character, I don't really care about him. What I care about is the song that plays when you fight him because it's a really good song. Shindo just sort of comes in for five has a cool like sword battle with Kiryu and then goes away. It's like okay I guess that's it but his song is so great that he should have came back just because of the song but he's just another guy that Kiryu has to fight. Kiwami 2's story goes much bigger with the added Jingwian Mafia and there being an all out war and while I like the atonement that Kiryu is trying to do and still trying to find a way to be happy through Haruka and now Sayama, having the story be bigger doesn't necessarily make it better. Not to say I didn't like the story, I enjoyed most of it but the reason why I like Kiwami 1 so much is because of Kiryu's and Nishiki's relationship. It was a more personal story. Ryuji is just another guy with a dragon tattoo that wants to see who's stronger. Kiryu now can finally move on with Haruka and Sayama and totally not come back for another game. Sayama. I left the Majima saga for last because I wanted to end my journey with Kiwami 2 by seeing what Majima was up to before the events of Kiwami 2 even started. Majima has his construction stuff going on during the events of Kiwami 2 and the only reason I bring this up is because of the Majima construction anthem. It's just another great thing from Majima. Majima deals with Ibuchi who plans on handing over power to the Omi Alliance but I don't care about that. What I care about is Mokoto. He meets her again at this massage place and she talks about leaving the area forever and still doesn't know who saved her from the events of Yakuza 0. She mentions her watch not being the same because the old strap got worn out and replaced it. 
She misses the old strap and since Majima hears all of this and asks one of her co-workers about when she's leaving, he decides to buy the original watch strap as a gift. Mogoto is on a plane and unwraps the gift and realizes that Majima was the one who saved her life. The watch and the person that saved her were the only things that she had unfinished business with and with it being done, she can finally move on and start her new life just as Majima did at the end of Yakuza 0. Also, why wasn't this longer? Majima gets a limited moveset. Why isn't there a game just focused on Majima? I don't think anyone would be a opposed to that at all. back to Spider-Man with Miles Morales and this one isn't as good as 2018 and I feel that it's mainly because of how short it is. I do appreciate on one hand that this game is a lot shorter however the character of Finn feels like it's not fleshed out enough or she's not given enough time. She turns out to be the villain going around terrorizing New York because her brother Rick died and now she wants revenge on the corporation that killed him. My issue is that why is she going after all of New York? Why not just that corporation but no she has to like get her own group and I don't know it just feels unnecessary even with the personal connection to her i didn't feel anything after she turned and then miles did what he did trying to save new york and then sacrificing herself i just felt nothing for her it had what 2018 had miles personal connection to the villain the swinging and all the combat still really fun and new because of miles powers but i don't know maybe 2018 was too damn good and so miles morales had a very higher bar to reach and to me it didn't really reach it at all and then just like the first game collect everything get upgrades unlock costumes the only difference being that there's a new game plus and i had to play the game again is slightly annoying but this game's fun enough and so i didn't mind it Number 48 was going to be another Assassin's Creed game and by this point I've realized I need to stop getting platinums for franchises in a row. 48 through 51 were all Assassin's Creed games and I should have spaced them out a lot more because this is what eventually caused me to have another burnout. The previous one I didn't notice it until afterwards. This time I noticed the burnout in the moment where I was like I don't feel like playing and I probably should have noticed this getting all the Yakuza platinums. I played in platinum three in a row but then I was like you know what I'll be fine and then after miles it's like I another franchise it's like oh great but assassin's creed 3 remastered so the funny thing about this game i still own my ps3 copy there's a known glitch for some missions where if you start a mission and turn off your ps3 you won't be able to finish that mission which means you won't be able to 100 percent the game i was like okay this is a remastered version before i went into the game i researched is that glitch fixed turns out it wasn't which is ridiculous they did everything else they remastered the graphic better whatever right but not this goddamn glitch and and so this entire time, I had that glitch in the back of my head every time I play the game where if I start a mission, I'm not turning it off until I finish it. For me, back on the PS3, it was the alien or UFO mission where people supposedly saw a UFO. I think at the time I was doing something else and then I turned it off, came back in. I was like, well, it's not there anymore. But anyways, I'm at a point with the Assassin's Creed games where the only way I'm going to play all these games is the story and setting. People have been saying it this whole time. They all sort of play the same. Every single Assassin's Creed game I've platinum them so far i've had a tradition with which is collecting everything and syncing everything up before finishing the last mission so that when i finish it the last sequence trophy pops with the 100 sequence and then the platinum i probably won't be doing that in the rpg games because i don't think they have 100 sequence requirements unless i'm wrong so like with every assassin's creed game there's again collectibles and viewpoints scanning at the homestead was really tedious and annoying i would have to wait certain days to get very specific people out the naval or ship missions i like them but again they'd be better later on in black flag the underground routes were useless i never used fast travel with these undergrounds and so to me they felt really tedious and then this would be desmond's last game he sacrifices himself with the eden for some reason i don't care because the main story is about connor and hatham a father and son who despite being related are far apart from each other connor grew up to be an assassin because his mother got killed by one of hatham's friends and then Hatham was a Templar, which I do like. The first three sequences, while three takes its time to get to Connor, I do like that the first three is playing as Hatham and then realizing that, oh, wait a minute, I'm playing a Templar. What's going on? And then Connor finds out about Templars and assassins from Achilles. And Connor's main mission is revenge again, just like Ezio. So that's not too interesting. But the most interesting parts were Connor interacting with his father and realizing that, you know what? They could have been a good team and duo, good father and son, right? And then George Washington is involved during the war as well. 
Connor's really stuck in the middle of all of that with the Templars and with Revenge. And then by the end, Connor has to kill him, which is a very sad moment because once again, you see glimpses of what their relationship could have been like, but then in the end, it can't work out. And I can see why people don't like Connor. He just doesn't say much or he's not very charismatic like Ezio. I had completely forgotten about there being a Assassin's Creed game on the Vita and 3DS. So when Assassin's Creed Liberation came a part of the remastered version of 3, I was like, okay, cool. Never really played this on the Vita because who even has a Vita? I will say, I thought it would be a lot more janky because it was on a handheld, but most of it, not all of it, was good. No issues with the control. It all felt like an Assassin's Creed game. I did have the break from the traditional Assassin's Creed thing that I did, which is get the platinum once you finish the game because this game had known glitches and since I was not familiar with it, I just did not want to replay the entire game again. So I finished the game and then collect everything afterward. You play as Evelyn, who's an assassin that can switch styles, which I do like. You can switch from assassin, which is pretty much what it sounds like. You have all your tools and hidden blades. The slave style is where you still have some assassin stuff, but you're also trying to fit in with the other slaves and get information. And then the lady style, pretty much you are dressed up, very limited mobility. You can't climb on rooftops. And so that's also to blend in and maybe seduce a person for information and then assassinating them and while i do like this i can also see why it wasn't brought back because it would just be kind of annoying and kind of a hassle to have to go into a changing room and then switch styles when you could just have all of it why split it up evelyn's trying to find out who the company man is along the way she meets connor which was kind of a cool sort of cameo for him just meeting him talking about who the company man is and then the company man turns out to be her stepmother who is a part of the templars she knows about evelyn and her activities and she she wants Evelyn to join the Templars and I do like the fake ending where Evelyn with no choice just decides to join but no that was just the fake ending and she kills her stepmother gets the prophecy disc also a part of the Eden and the first civilization again I don't really care about this and there's no real like present day stuff which I do like I could just focus on Evelyn and the assassin stuff rather than cutting it to some first person view of a present day stuff but overall I think this game's still good wise words captain wise words Number 50 was Assassin's Creed Rogue and while I do like the ship stuff, by this point I was tired of it. It added to my burnout and so I just sort of wanted to get past it really quickly, especially with the legendary ships, which I think were also in the fourth one, so I forgot to talk about it, but it kind of works the same way here where there's four legendary ships and you have to get rid of all of them. The hardest one in this one and in Black Flag is facing two at a time. I found a video of a person essentially just trying to get behind the one ship that is constantly shooting, get behind them and then shoot the other one and then the other one is eventually taken out leaving the one that's constantly shooting that one was the only one that gave me trouble and then it's like any other assassin's creed game where you have to visit every area collect everything and this is also another assassin's creed game where i can see people really liking it because of shay he is the assassin turned templar because most of his beliefs are more aligned with the templars and so throughout the entire game you see him at first starting out as an assassin you even see achilles but then eventually by the end he's like you know what the assassins are whack and then I love that he's pretty much the reason why the events of Unity started. And so this game takes place during, I mean, I guess before, during 3 and after 3. And then at the very beginning of Unity. And then finally, Assassin's Creed Syndicate. This was the last one before it went on a two year break, coming back with Origins in 2017. And this one went back to the basics. Very much no ships, no other things, just back to Assassin parkour stuff, which this one has the best parkour. You can just hold one button and you can climb up or down. And this is kind of the first one that they dive into the RPG elements before Origins. While it's still pretty much any other Assassin's Creed game, there's a level up system for both Jacob and Evie. And I don't think that's been a thing before origins or this game it seems like ubisoft was already thinking about let's have this kind of be like an rpg type of game before committing it in origins jacob and evie are siblings and they both are assassins both want to liberate london from templars because they have pretty much all of london however both have very different methods of going about defeating the templars jacob is very much like head-on going in for a fight not really thinking about anything while evie is much more of the typical assassin sneaking around not getting seen 
scene and for the most part I chose Eevee because that's my preferred way of playing and they both realize that they are better together because the villain is I don't know the London guy I forget who he was both as a team work better rather than apart there's the World War One simulation where you play as Eevee during the first world war and this is the closest we've ever gotten to the present day stuff this is around 1910 and so it's the closest that we'll see of the present day stuff with the assassins before it went modern with the actual present day destroying 5,000 destructibles what I did to make this easier was whenever I had the carriage during the story I would just go on the streets and destroy the lights the trees and whatnot and then constantly go around this circle so that I wouldn't take I don't know like four hours or whatever it only took half that time aside from this though it's pretty much any other Assassin's Creed game I like Jacob and Evie as characters and I like the parkour London setting sure it's cool I guess just a lot of London buildings and I do want to play the Jack the Ripper DLC because it just looks cool. So after going through four games that were essentially the same, I needed a break. And what better game to just have a quick platinum other than my friend Peppa Pig. This is a well-known shovelware game and this game is a definition of a shovelware game where it only has like one or two moves. Press X to talk to other animals and characters. That's it. That's all I had to do. I got this under an hour. It's nothing really. I have nothing to say about it. Just like with Ratchet and Clank, Sly Cooper was never a game or franchise that I never really wanted to play because I didn't grow up playing the original trilogy on PS2 and it just never appealed to me. I got through two of the games. The first one is a very simple platinum. You just collect all the bottles from all the levels and open all the vaults. And my only issue with this game and the second game is that whenever it wasn't a platformer, I had a hard time with it, especially the final boss fights where it's like a rail shooter and it's just like, why are you making me do this i get trying to have a bunch of variety on the game but i signed up for a platformer game and so whenever i switch to hey play this new type of game now it's like hold on wait a minute i was not ready at all and then the second game was made a lot easier because I only have to collect I think 30 bottles throughout the entire game and so I don't have to go to every single level collect all the bottles and they add two more playable characters Bentley and Murray. Bentley's hacking sections were a lot more easier. The first one was just sort of not hard not the most optimal and so this one sort of has you playing like arcade like game shooting a bunch of red ships and whatnot. However him being on the ground and fighting actual enemies not the best and so anytime I use him I try to avoid all fights. Murray is the heavy hitter. He's just super big, hits hard, and so he was really easy to play with. And then the actual store for both games so far, I think it's just a heist. I think they're just like people that like stealing. It's kind of weird being the protagonist of people going on a heist. I don't really remember the story. It didn't stand out. And then I immediately went back to shorter games, starting with DC League of Super Pets, Crypto, and some other dog. This was a very okay rail shooter. The only hard trophy was killing no leg spot because naturally, if there's an enemy in front of you, I would want to get rid of it, but pull back for the very first level. Tacoma was a space adventure game and I immediately knew that I did not want to spend hours looking for every collectible or trying to figure out things on my own. I looked up a video guide on a person doing it in like 18-17 minutes. I wasn't trying to go for a world record of getting the platinum. I just wanted to get through this really quickly. And then Undertale. This was a huge game back in I think 2014 or 15 and at the time I couldn't care less about it because I was still on Black Ops 2 and since it was a part of the PS Plus Extra game catalog I was like okay let me give this game a try and I can see why this game was a huge thing back then because something about it is super charming. The way it can just pretty much break the fourth wall and the music and all of the characters that you interact with are all very memorable and like with some other games I somehow messed up getting all the missable trophies because there are donating money to the dog shrine and I didn't know that I had a spare papyrus and so I killed him I did not spare him at all and you know just went about the game until after looking at my guide I was like oh wait I had to spare him and so I went through the game up until pretty much the last boss fight start a completely new game and then get to that point to spare him and then go to the dog shrine and then donate 350 G's and then I did not finish the game because it's not needed for the platinum and I don't plan on going back to it because if I have a platinum for a game I just move on to the the next game i'll just look up a youtube video of someone else playing it i'm all right with not completing the game lost judgment was the next yakuza game in my journey of getting every platinum from the series there's a specific reason why I don't have the Platinum Trophy for the first Judgment game. Even though I'm 90% through the trophies, there's this one thing that's preventing me from getting the Platinum, but whenever I get back to it, I'll talk about it, why it took me forever to get it. 
I'm not gonna go for the DLC trophies even though I really want to play Kaito Files. This isn't the first time RGG put out DLC for a Yakuza game, but this is the one time that it isn't just a costume or items that can already be bought within the game. It was an expansion on Kaito who was never playable and added the boxer style which from what I've seen doesn't seem to be worth it. And there were now trophies added post launch which never happened until this game. Thing I've noticed since going for all the platinum trophies is that there's one or a few things that are annoying and make me dread going through the game. In Kiwami it was Manjan due to how long it took me to reach the requirements. While I didn't need to 100% Yakuza 6, most of the mini games suck and having to finish the entire clan creator story wasn't all too great. And in Kiwami 2 it was the peen mini games and Manjan again as it took just almost a full day to reach all requirements. For Lost Judgment, it was getting SP. I thought using a bunch of Hue Bomb Omega drinks would ease the process because it gave a lot in the first Judgment game, but this time around, that was not the case at all. And it's a normal thing for RGG to not bring back certain mechanics from previous games. For example, the double health bar from Yakuza 5. I thought it was cool going to certain restaurants and not only did it give you another life bar, but it also gave you a certain stat boost depending on which restaurant you went to. The vending machines and specifically Muscle Soda, while it is OP as hell, why not just have it in the game? Some Sometimes I don't want to have to deal with the boss and muscle soda just makes it really easy. One of the better ways of getting a lot of SP is through fighting random people. Every time I saw a group of enemies, I would go up and fight them. Even after completing the battle list, I would go up and fight them just for more SP. And then there's this bonus SP list where if you don't get hit during the fight or use all the styles and then you get a bit more SP after the fight ends. The completion list is now in an app called Town Go. Some of it's the same from the previous games. Earning a total of 100,000 points while skateboarding was something new. Some of it I got just by riding the skateboard throughout the city because not only was it fun using it, but I could also avoid all fights. I didn't have to go around them or wait until they went further away. I just went past them and traveling as well was made a lot better. Flying the drone for an hour, I just got by playing the racing drone mini game. Using 100 extracts felt useless because I never used them at all. All have a very specific stat boost for very specific reasons and aside from one part, I see no reason other than just more stuff to do in the game. Collecting 500 materials helped with making extracts. Collecting these or anything after defeating an enemy was made a lot easier. Some enemies will drop items or money and in the first game I would have to go up and get the item but this time around if I didn't get to it then the item would hover around me and it would automatically give me the item. A small quality of life change that made playing the game game better. Using 16 keywords in the Buzz Researcher app, which I sort of forgot about this one. I was so uninterested right from the start when I had to use it for a sub story or story reasons that I just sort of forgot what it did. I mean, you just search words on the app. Uh, some sub stories are tied to it. I think that's about it. It might have to do with some investigations, but yeah, it's just a tool that you use for stuff. Playing with the cats 100 times was more on the grindy side because some cats prefer certain things and so I would fail on some of them and I had to go away and come back and try again but it helped with playing with them for 100 times. Some cats even gave me school books so it wasn't entirely useless. And then walking the dog for 10 kilometers, at a certain point a dog is introduced and it helps with some investigations and helps with looking for certain squirrels or people around the city. It didn't take too long for me to just walk around with the dog until the completion list pops up. battle list pretty much the same with the only difference being that Yagami has different styles of fighting. Tiger style is better in a single fight or boss fights and is my preferred style to play as because I don't know whether it's the strongest of the three styles but I'm gonna assume that it is the strongest one and being able to hold triangle for better damage always feels good whenever it hits and usually drawback is that it's slow and while Tiger is slower than Crane and probably Snake style it wasn't slow enough for me to not use it unlike with B style which was way too slow for me. Crane style is crowd control. If there are too many enemies, then I just use crane style and activated EX boost. And most of the time I was able to clear out enemies. It was the only time that I really used it for large crowds. There was never a point where I chose crane style over tiger style. And then snake style, which I didn't use all too much aside from defeating 500 enemies for the requirements. The way it was introduced was awesome. Yagami and Kaito see a bunch of students bully a store owner and both take it upon themselves to mess with them. And the best part about snake style was the fake out EX moves. And aside from messing with enemies with fake outs, I didn't have any use for it. Moving sort of like a snake was cool, but at the end of the day, it wasn't for me. 
combat overall for the judgment games are really fun being able to jump off walls to get out of a corner or just use it anytime you want was a great addition creating new styles rather than using already known styles made sense because yagami isn't a yakuza member there are similarities to the yakuza games but it's able to have its own identity while also being in the series and i've also never juggled in this game i first saw it in a speed run and i wanted to try it out but every time i start up the game i always forget You're in this go for a good amount of the time at the beginning of the game and there are a bunch of clubs that I had to complete for each of their stories which I didn't care about at all for any of the stories. There's a mystery going on and each story is supposed to get me closer to figuring out what it was. The dancing club was the best one because I got to see Yagami dance in a variety of ways that were both amazing and ridiculous. Long drill on the beach was the best one and it's a bit of a challenge on the harder difficulties to reach a higher score for all the songs because I had to be perfect for the most part. I didn't like the robotics club. It's a minigame that's not interesting to me at all, and the auto button is useless. If there's an auto button to automatically play the minigame, I expect it to be good, but no, it's not good at all. And so after one session of using it and watching how my robot did, I had to play the game and I dreaded doing every single mission that I had to do. I enjoyed the boxing club, most of it was doable and there were a few fights that took a bit to learn what the pattern was but then eventually learning the pattern led to victory, that's pretty much it aside from the story, just punch your way to victory in the completion list. I wish the Bagger Gang Club was a lot better during the races rather than just getting past all the opponents and then beating the boss in a race. Why not have me attack back because it sucks having just to watch an attack come and then get hit? Why can't there be a counter attack or something like that to avoid getting hit rather than just racing past or bumping into all of them? Customizing is available for all the clubs to make either the bike, robot, dances, and even upgrading and boxing better and easier to get through the clubs. There's a photography club where I had to take the perfect picture with the right focus and moment to pass all of them and it was alright. Nothing exciting or bad about it. There's a casino that can be a lock and this casino is what makes you a lot of money by playing blackjack. There's a video by Yanare Gogeta and he showed how to make a ton of money really fast by playing blackjack and using the 21 bust and then using the chips to get platinum and gold plates and then selling them for about I think 2 or 3 million. The girls bar I don't really remember much about aside from defeating each of the hostesses at darts three times. Forgot how this ties into the school mystery but since I don't remember this then I guess it was a forgettable part of the club stories. Skateboarding was part of the school club stories and like I said earlier skateboarding is really fun free roaming in the city and it's also fun when I was racing with other opponents and even beating the high score in the other modes being able to do tricks to get higher score was a great addition to what was already an amazing way of traveling in both cities and it's also another thing that RGG should add in their future games just be a permanent thing. The esports club was playing Virtua Fighter 5 and beating all the rivals which meant I enjoyed my time with the esports club and it went by really quickly. And then the mystery research club was just completing all the other clubs and having its own ending which again I couldn't care less about. In terms of minigames, the batting center is obviously back as well as Shogi which I still haven't learned how to play. And why is Mahjong back? RGG has to know that Mahjong at this point is the worst when it comes to completing the completion list. Darts and golf are always great. Capsule machines have toys in them and it's purely an RNG on whether or not I get all of them. Luckily, I don't need to spend a lot of money on these because I can see other people being stuck on this just because of one toy. A bit of a lame minigame due to the RNG aspect of it. I missed Ersolos almost entirely. I didn't realize that it was right next to the Dyson Cubit minigame. It's a simple game where it's a twin stick shooter and I had to get the highest score on all 9 stages. I failed if I collided with the enemies a few times or even if time ran out. The energy wave was the best weapon but there was a limited amount so I chose to use it only when there was a ton of enemies around or else this minigame would have been easier but what matters is if it was fun and it was. Dyson Cube is pretty much Mario Party. That was the first thing that came to mind when I first played it. Lost Judgment's Dyson Cube is different from the one in Judgment. Lost Judgment now requires you to choose a rival to race to the finish line, which makes this minigame even longer. I don't mind this minigame. I do like it, but it really does take forever sometimes to get through one game, especially on the long courses. The rival can skip my turn. I could lose a dice when I land on the minus three spaces. There are a variety of ways to prolong this minigame. When all I wanted was to fulfill the requirements, there are some 
some spaces when it takes you into a fight with enemies or even a tiger or a drone shooting section, activating Koro Neon mode by rolling a 5, 6, and 2 in that succession or what I did was finding him on the board and automatically giving me the mode. The mode grants you every space being safe and bonus challenges. Using 100 skills wasn't too hard. I always used a skill that gave me extra spaces because I didn't want to take any chances of playing a course for the first time, losing, and then replaying it again. Drone races were easier this time around, and I think it's because of playing it in Judgment. I got used to how the drone would control, and so when it came to Lost Judgment, I got past most of the races relatively fast. The only one that was difficult was the one in the school. I didn't know when to turn due to how small the hallways were, but after failing a couple of times, I eventually got through it as well. And it's better to buy drone parts as soon as they are available because they're the best parts for the next upcoming races. More will be added on, and then just repeat this until you eventually get all the best parts. There are returning arcade games like Fantasy Zone, Space Harrier, Super Hang-On, Virtua Fighter 5 Final Showdown, and of course UFO Catcher. Fighting Vapris is a 3D fighter and it sort of plays like a Virtua Fighter, the difference being the armor. I didn't realize until very later on that armor was being taken off from the opponent and myself if either one does a powerful strike and I didn't know how to do one so I just mashed the entire game. Sonic Fighters is probably the only game from Sega that I don't know from playing the Yakuza games. I played Sonic Fighters on the GameCube when it was a part of the Sonic collection and Sonic Fighters was a part of the games and I had a ton of fun playing it even though I was losing a bunch and couldn't get past the final boss which is still the case in the present. I only needed to beat all 8 characters, the final one being a mirror match, but there are two final bosses, Metal Sonic and Dr. Eggman. I gave up after not being able to get past Metal Sonic but it was nice to relive childhood memories and I'm now able to constantly relive it through a Yakuza game. Motor Raid is what I wanted from the Biker Gang Club to be where everyone is racing but I have a weapon to hit the other opponents and steal other weapons if mine was taken rather than just having nothing to do. There was a bunch of fighting happening throughout most of the races and it made it go by really quickly. I didn't need to reach first place, I just needed to pass each of the races both in practice mode and the full 3 track course. Hama of the Dead is pretty much Dead Souls, but it's now an arcade rail shooter. There's even reused enemies that were in Dead Souls like the Meathead, the liquor that isn't called a liquor, but it's pretty much a liquor from Resident Evil. All of it was fun, but it is the one arcade game that's the most grindy because I needed 500 kills and 777 headshots. It's a very specific number, I don't know why, but I didn't mind it because this minigame was short and fun. However, these aren't the only Sega games to be in this game. There's a Sega Master System next to Yagami's office and it's waiting to be played and there are 8 games. I didn't play all of these because all I did was go into each game, play for maybe a minute and then back out and it counted towards the completion. These 8 games were Alex Kidd, Enduro Racer, Fantasy Zone, Maze Hunter 3D, Penguin Land, Quartet, Secret Command, and Woody Pop. Fantasy Zone is also available to play in the other arcades and I only know of Alex Kidd because of the remake. Aside from these two, I couldn't tell you much about the other games. The sub stories or side cases in this game, I didn't like most of them. Some were a simple task like finding a squirrel and I could find the rest on my own. The bar side cases were okay. Some were at the school and they weren't all that interesting. And some were even more detective work, which makes sense because Yagami is a detective, but I wish more of them got away from the detective stuff and more were just random stuff that was happening while I was running around on the street. There were only a few side cases that I enjoyed. Somebody's watching you starts off as another detective case. A woman named Kyoko feels like she's being watched and asks Yagami to see if anyone's following her. After tailing her, the eyes that were watching her turn out to be a black cat. Both learn through an old lady that the cat's name is Cherry and the owner of Sakura died in a car accident and lived on the second floor of a clinic. The old lady turns out to be Sakura's mother and she hasn't been able to move on from her death. Cherry on the other hand moved on and has been searching for another owner and home. Kyoko decides to be Cherry's new owner while Sakura's mother will finally move on just like Cherry has. This could have been another detective case but turned into a sad but heartwarming story by the end. A new partner gives Yagami the dog to search for secret items only found using the dog or most likely during story related sections to search for people. Aside from the completion requirements, it was cool at any time just to bring out the dog to walk around. That's the reason why I like it. Flight of the Game Creator tells the story of how some game developers work long hours and sometimes even overtime. A game developer goes missing for this reason. He's tired of working long hours and the producer doesn't care. He wants the game done within a certain deadline. Developers don't 
don't get to decide when the game comes out or how it's priced. They're on strings like a puppet and are told what to do. The producer is a Yakuza and uses Yakuza methods to force everyone to keep on working. Yagami beats him up and still the director doesn't want to come back. So the producer apologizes and pleads with the director to come back because he's what makes the game. And then he agrees to come back. So while it ends in a very happy way, I don't think it would apply in actual game development. If the game director leaves, they would probably be let go of and the game still gets worked on. It still has a deadline and it'll come out probably buggy as hell on launch day. There's a fake Yagami going around and giving Yagami a bad reputation. There are people with weapons who are willing to hurt him just because of this imposter. So Yagami takes care of it. It's another imposter side story, but I don't know. These imposter sub stories are always fun to go through. And then the Amon fight who is replaced by another Amon named Juzo Amon. And so far this is the only time where an Amon fight was really hard. I couldn't constantly spam the same EX moves because it does less damage after the first initial news. And once Juzo goes into his last state it was impossible. I could barely get a hit on him and he regenerates his health. And this was on easy difficulty and I was still having a hard time. So I decided to search if anyone has an easy method. And there were videos on easily defeating him and it came down to one extract the warrior's onslaught extract allows me to constantly break through the enemy's guard which may leave them in a stunned state and after a few tries once juzo went to his final state i used the extract and spam circle to attack until he was defeated while this amon fight was challenging it got annoying and frustrating real fast and most of the time i don't look forward to them because aside from having a tradition of having one after completing all sub stories they're not fun boss fights they feel challenging or cheap for the sake of having a really hard boss fight Legend difficulty on the other hand was real easy and was like the other games of having all upgrades but now with the warriors onslaught boss fights were made a lot easier to go through. There was a gauntlet mode which is just the game's version of climax battles and I didn't need to play all the stages I only needed to complete a few because it gave skill books and to be honest I didn't want to have to deal with another mode either dealing with mini games Amon and just the other stuff. And then I almost forgot about the climbing mechanic. There are certain sections where I need to sneak past multiple enemies or just climb up a side of a building. And there's a meter that pops up and I'm limited on how much I can climb and then not do anything until the meter isn't in red anymore. And it fills up a reasonable amount. This was unnecessary. Why not allow me just to climb or walk on the side of buildings without having to worry about a mechanic that adds nothing? <laughs> Lost Judgment starts out as a simple bully case that's happening out of school and it somehow turns into a conspiracy theory that involves a government and then of course people start dying and it's up to Yagami, his agency and friends to find out what's really going on. It's three years after the first judgment game and firefighters are called for a possible fire that's taking place in an abandoned building but it turns out to be fake and rather than fighting fire they find a decaying body. Akihiro Ihara who is at trial for trying to put his hands up a woman's skirt somehow knows about this body when it hasn't even been made public yet. Ihara says the body belongs to Hiro Mikushiba and believes he deserves to die due to driving his son to commit suicide because the law failed and let him walk. Yagami gets a call from Saori to check it out because it probably has ties to Ihara, the bully case, and the body. Kaito is just a great guy to have around, former Yakuza member that's willing to help Yagami find justice by using and doing the unconventional things. I like Saori's part where I had to go undercover to get information. It was brought back from the first game and it had a bigger impact in the first game because I wasn't expecting for there to be one section dedicated just to her. Tsukumo was a side character that was in a side case in the first game and he now has a role as both he and Sugira started their own agency in Yokohama and serves as a second hideout for Yagami and Kaido. Tsukumo does mainly the hacking stuff but like with Sari, I didn't expect a side character with no significance to come back. The school stuff I sort of checked out on every now and then because school settings don't do much for me but what I did love was beating up a bunch of high school students. Yagami constantly runs into the same group of bullies and he's always kicking their asses. After the second fight I realized that he was beating up a bunch of kids and there were no consequences 
purposes for him at all. I'd like to imagine other students seeing a grown ass adult fighting students and just walking the other way or watching how it turns out because the students were bullies. And I guess that's why he makes it okay, even though it really isn't. The students who were bullies by the end weren't anymore. Yagami and the others were able to convince them that don't be a bully. And then I guess Yagami just isn't allowed to be in trouble. RK is a group that on the outside just looks like a gang, but it turns out that the group has ties to public security, which is a government that keeps tabs on the underground crime as the Tojo clan and Omi Alliance aren't a thing anymore. I don't care about this group or the people in them. Soma is the leader and pretty much all of public security. Only stands out because of his dust allergy and carries a cloth around in every scene that he's in. I never found him to be a threat at all. The most interesting character was Kuwana. He starts out as an ally, but the more you learn about him, you realize that he's a serial killer. But he doesn't kill just because he enjoys it. He kills because he thinks it's necessary to get rid of certain people that make the world a bad place. And all of it goes back to the school, bullies, Sawa, who is currently a teacher, and Reiko. Kuwana was a teacher who kept hearing about one of the students getting bullied and Sawa was a student of his who begged him to do something about it. So he put a camera to see if the bullying was as bad as it was or if it was just kids being kids. Turns out this kid was getting beaten by a bunch of other students and there's something that should have been done about it. But before Kuwana could do anything, the kid committed suicide and this entire situation was covered up. This was the catalyst for Kuwana being a serial killer. He felt so much guilt for not being able to do anything and maybe brushing off most of the concerns of other students as boys being boys that he justified getting revenge on the students by blackmailing them and pinning the murders on them. Both Kuwana and Ihara were trying to prove that the law and justice system was flawed and let horrible people still walk freely when they should have been punished and both were willing to kill to get revenge in their way of justice. While they're right that the law fails, killing obviously isn't the answer to replacing it. Yagami and Kuwana bumping heads and constantly fighting each other were my favorite parts of the game because of their version of justice. Yagami acknowledges that the law fails but it'll take time for it to evolve and hopefully in the future not let people who deserve to be punished just easily be let go of. Kuwana still lives at the end and he's able to walk away because legally Yagami and the others can't touch him and he still believes in his ideals and probably will continue to bend the rules of the law but he knows Yagami will be there whenever he starts up again. Lost Judgment's story overall, I thought was good. Kiwana was the best part about it because his ideals clash with Yagami's. I didn't care about the school stuff, but it does play a big part in Kiwana's motives. And I honestly could have done without RK as a whole and would have preferred more of Yagami and Kiwana's banter with each other, which is what the game gave us. But I just wanted a lot more. <laughs> Ghost of Tsushima. This was a huge game back in 2020 when everyone was still stuck at home and it's a very simple story. Jin wants to free Japan of the Mongols who want to just pretty much control all of Japan and so he's on a journey to get his revenge and get the freedom and independence for all of Japan. The trophy list is also very simple. I just had to play the game and collect and do mostly everything. Killing Mongols certain ways, making them fall off a bunch of cliffs and whatnot, using different types of methods of defeating them bowing at 10 different places various miscellaneous things but are all doable without a guide for the most part there are two things that I had to look up because there's i think one or two things that don't pop up on the map and you had to go out of your way to find a certain npc talk to them and then it would pop up later on and this game really works because of the atmosphere because combat wise it's fun but it doesn't reinvent the wheel or do anything new or special it is 100 the atmosphere and just being a samurai on a mission meeting other various people that have their own Mongols and then eventually get into the Mongols. Starting with number 60, this is where I decided to get 100 platinum trophies before 2023 ended. And for the most part, most of these games I wanted to play. However, there are some that I only played because they would only take a couple of hours to get through. And so I started out by getting 4 Platinums in one day. Pinball Heroes was a game I already played and the only pinballs I had left to do were the Uncharted, That Princess, and Mod Nation ones. And it was made a lot easier because of the rewind feature which allows you to just go back in time and it would help out for most of the games I played on here. 
Loco Roco Midnight Carnival. I have never heard of before. This came out, I think, on the PSP. And all I had to do was use the L and R buttons to move around this little circle character thing to go from to left, right, up, or down, whatever it may be, to pass each level. And I didn't need to really complete most of them. The hardest parts were the swinging, which I just could not figure out. Going left and right would not create enough momentum for me. And so I just pretty much winged it. Only took me like two, maybe three hours intelligent cube at first i was confused by on what i needed to do but after learning just to get rid of the cube this was a lot easier and it's sort of a good entry for puzzle games i think there is ways of clearing each level in a better way i think i cleared it probably the worst ways possible because i didn't get the highest score but i just needed to get through all of the levels and beat the game and i had a really great time with it and the second game that was only released in japan is also available and so i'll probably get to that game as well and then Jumping Flash was the last one. And this is a first person platformer game with a ton of secret levels and I think coins or not coins but something to collect defeat a boss without using any sort of weapons aside from jumping which I had to look up and it was just the first big dinosaur boss fight. Just jump on him and you'll be good. Don't really have much to say about it. You just jump around past the level. Just a really simple game and the last one to get before the day had ended. I probably won't be doing this again getting four platinums in a day because it is a lot and just a great way to burn yourself out with for some reason I love doing and this can be easily done with very short shovelware games but I don't really plan on playing a lot of those at all. Siphon Filter was a game and franchise I have never heard of before and there were five of them that were available and all five had platinums and all can be done in about eight hours each which is another thing I also forgot to mention. I needed to play a lot more shorter games that were around the two to eight hour mark because I love taking my sweet ass time with pretty much most of my games and so if it's anywhere over that then I'm not gonna get anywhere close to 100 before 2023 ends. But Siphon Filter, the controls suck. Jesus Christ, the inverted controls and like the first person even even shooting all that in the first game does not hold up at all whatsoever and it can be changed the second third and pretty much every other game you can go into settings and change it but this one hell no you can't change it i just had to get used to it there were miscellaneous trophies like shooting down a bunch of windows killing an enemy with every single weapon while the other trophies are story related and that's pretty much the same for most of the games they don't really have any other miscellaneous trophies aside from story trophies and the story itself in this first game cannot tell you about because i can completely forgot about it. I think this came out during or after Metal Gear Solid 1 and I feel like every game wanted to be like that. Same thing in Siphon Filter 2. It has all the same trophies. I forgot whether it's this one or the third game where there's a trophy for killing an enemy with a knife but once you do that it's all story and mission based trophies. Second and third game has that. Dark Mirror is the first one on the PSP and it still has really just not great controls at all and the only thing I remember is that Logan is not the villain but he's a monster. He can't go back to meet a normal person in society anymore. Logan's shadow is the only one that had good controls. It took them five games to make a good third person shooter because all of these are technically third person shooters but the first four are so awkward they just don't control well at all and so Logan's shadow is the only second filter game that has good controls and like the rest of the games it has a story that I don't particularly remember or care about. I was initially excited to play all of these games but after playing them they were just okay with most of them having bad controls. Twisted Metal 1 and 2. Once again, these games were before my time. I've heard a lot about them. I've always heard that these games are a lot of fun, and they are. Pretty sure this would be way more fun with local co-op. I had to use all of the cars and beat the game with them, which was a bit annoying because some of them aren't as good as others, and this could have been a lot easier with the glitch. However, it was patched, so I had to do this legitimately, which wasn't too bad. My favorite was the dark side because I love just crashing into other cars. Then Twisted Metal 2 is pretty much the same. There's new cars in it you had to beat the game with every car and luckily i was able to use the glitch for getting to the last boss fight however in using infinite ammo and just being invincible that would negate the trophy so i couldn't use that and it's got the same miscellaneous trophies of killing a car with a collision or machine gun driving in the water or fire stuff like that but overall these are easy doable just kind of wish that the glitches weren't patched so that i could just do these very quickly the next two were paw patrol games and yeah these were the first two that i did not care for for. Both took only a couple of hours. I was like, okay. Mighty Pups Save Adventure Bay is a very basic, okay type of game. The other one, the movie Adventure City Calls, for some reason the rail shooter parts were a lot slower. But aside from that, it's also a very okay type of game. I don't know anyone who's a fan of Paw Patrol, but these games are alright. 
unpacking is a game about unpacking everything, unpacking boxes and putting objects, books, lamps, laptops, and various items on where they need to be. And the game still manages to tell a story throughout the different levels. You obviously start out as a baby in a crib and then you see the backpacks, the notebooks, staplers, notebooks and whatnot for school stuff, going to college, laptops, dorm rooms, roommates, and then eventually the adult stuff, you're married and now you have a kid. Despite being a very simple concept and game, it still manages to tell a story just by unpacking all of their stuff. The Light and the Darkness is a free game that is available when you go to the PS Store. Just go look for free games and it's right there along with Fortnite and Rocket League. And this game tells the story of a Polish Jew family during the Holocaust. And just throughout the game, it just gets dire and more depressing. At first, this family's a very fine family, you know. They own a house. They have a business store, I think. The mother and father works, I think, clothing stuff. And then the kid is just being a kid, you know, hanging around, playing with other kids. But then slowly but surely one by one they get taken taken to the camp and they eventually get killed because they were jewish and then by the end i just felt real sad real depressing obviously these people didn't deserve it and even does show real photos of jewish people just people that would have been alive if they weren't killed Call of the Sea was a puzzle game and I just didn't want to spend the time to figure out the puzzles. And so from start to end, I followed a video guide, watching this video and following it step by step. And then a couple of hours later, the platinum popped up for me. Couldn't really tell what the story was about, what was going on. Ape Escape is another known PlayStation IP where I didn't really hear anything about it, honestly. So that's why I wanted to try it out. And first thing, once again, controls for some of the older games, I just don't really like. Why is it inverted controls? Was that just a norm back in, I don't know, the 90s or PS1, PS2 days? Because I don't like it at all. The game is very simple. You gotta catch a lot of apes with your net and then collect some Spectre coins along the way. Play three mini games at the end and that's it. There's a boss fight, which I don't really remember who or what it was it's another very simple game that took around eight hours and that's the same case for the psp remake ape escape on the loose which obviously controls better it's pretty much the same game with different modes of them jake attacks which are just racing tracks against jake and then time attacks beating certain levels in a specific amount of time looks better and controls better and that's pretty much it there is a story but it's not one where i remember it at all Ape Academy 2 is essentially a Mario Party but with rock paper scissors in between the mini games. I had to beat the other ape in a rock paper scissor game and then go into the various different mini games which range from okay to easy and mostly easy. There wasn't one that stood out nor was it too hard and honestly if Sony ever decides to bring this IP back which I don't think they will I wouldn't mind if this came back and just pretty much was Mario Party but the Ape Academy but that's only if the game is good with very good mini games. That's a really big if. Pursuit Force and Pursuit Force Extreme Justice were really fun games. Both games had cars or boat levels but essentially getting to a certain destination by either sticking with the car that you have or jumping into other cars to reset your health and then just keep doing that until you get to the final point of each level. And then of course there were the boss levels which all of them were also really fun as well. And so go out of your way to play these games. If you have PS Plus Premium, which I'm assuming most of you guys don't because paying $160 yearly for premium is not really worth it. They might be hard depending if you don't like racing games and so if you don't really like these types of games then it's probably not for you. And it sort of reminds me of arcade games where you're just constantly on the move having to make quick decisions, pass the level and then you could do it over and over again. The only reasons why I played Goosebumps the game was one, it was leaving PS Plus and two, it's Goosebumps. I remember having to read, I think during first or second grade, having to read one of the books and I remember just most of the covers and thinking, man, there's gonna be some cool ass pictures in there because as a kid, I didn't want to read a boring ass book on history or English literature, arts or whatever it was. And so once I opened the book, it was like, oh, this is all text, this is boring, whatever. And I also knew the TV theme song, probably one of the most recognizable horror intros. The game is a port and click which meant I wasn't going to spend any effort into actually figuring out what to pick up and choose, especially when there's a trophy tied to having less than a certain amount of turns. And there was various ways to die, which were tied to trophies. And I definitely would have known about getting killed by drink or potion from the old ass lady in that house or whatever, followed it all the way through and got the platinum in like four to five ish hours. My little pony, I do not care about this game. It took about two hours. I collected stuff. I played as a pony, talked to other ponies that's all i remember there might be a plot to it there probably is but i don't care just another really fast platinum for me
Lost Worlds Beyond the Page. It looked like an interesting game just based on the cover. And while I do like the game, it also didn't leave a huge impact on me. It's a 2D adventure where you're just going around collecting collectibles and swimming in certain areas. The characters, the story, and even some areas. I'm like forgetting what the hell it was. There's a water area because there has to be a water area. But aside from that, I'm like trying to come up with what to say about it because I sort of forgot about it. Even though I remember playing it and being like, this is a fun game, just did not leave a huge impression on me. Giganotosaurus is an actual game about a dinosaur or just different types of dinosaurs where you play as a dinosaur. You're just going around and collecting eggs and running from bosses and you're in different types of levels. This is a really weird one. I was sort of getting tired of games that I thought I was interested in but then turned out to be not or just games that I have completely no interest in and so this game was sort of the weird pick for me where I was like I'm gonna give this a try and it's a very okay game. Just collect everything and beat the game number 85 was killzone liberation so i was never into this series because to me it just looked like another first person shooter and at the time once again black ops 2 was my only first person shooter game at the time and so i was like you know what i want at least one platinum from this series and this game is the only one that's very easy because the second third game and pretty much every other game has multiplayer trophies and i do not want to play multiplayer killzone or have to get multiplayer trophies i went into liberation thinking that it was going to be a first person shooter but it wasn't at all it was an over the top shooter sort of like black ops 1 arcade zombies and so that was a nice surprise and this is another game where i didn't need to finish the entire game i only needed to complete four out of the five acts i think which was great because i was not interested in what was going on in the story all i knew was shooting people down using a tank for one section and then some boat sections on some water and then there's challenge mode this game would have been a lot harder or taken a lot longer by getting gold medals for all of the maps but luckily i only need 10 i would have dreaded doing the spider cages because trying to get them in really fast just was not working they take their sweet ass time and i always get a silver or a bronze so i don't know how the hell you get a gold medal on that but if they know so it's doable defending a camp or there are specific objectives that i had to do like planting bombs and whatnot probably the easiest kill zone game to platinum because of there being no multiplayer trophies foreclosed is a non-stop action game where i constantly had to be on the move or else nothing would really happen aside from collecting collectibles pretty much rewards you for just being on the move aside from the combat which i will remember for the telekinesis move which is bouncing off bullets i'll remember the comic book panels of the game where there's certain points where the game switches it up you're in this comic book panel look and you have to see yourself walk or just play through that and then go to the next session it usually pops up after a big wave of enemies and then you're like on the run on the outside it's probably loaded in assets and whatnot and then go into the next area but visually it was pleasing to look at because it could have just been a very normal first person on the run looking at your legs and thank god i got all the collectibles on my first run because this game was only three to four hours i had planned on just playing it blindly on my first playthrough and then a second playthrough of collecting all the collectibles but luckily i didn't do that because there's a secret ending on getting all the collectibles and it's a very short scene of someone hijacking the signal and then having some other person saying i'm plugging everything honestly they didn't do much for me by the end of the game you get to either choose free will which means being a fugitive and being on the run or go back to being a very normal day in the life of being as a cure tech and i chose being a fugitive the first Ape Escape Academy game for some reason wasn't available whenever I was playing the second one but it eventually got added to the classic catalog and at the time there was no guide for it but I didn't think I needed it because the second one was very easy and just pretty much do everything in the game. However I was wrong once again because I didn't know until very late in the game that not all mini games are playable or guaranteed. Some if not all of them are RNG based which means I would have to just essentially restart over and over again to to get the one mini game that I needed so I would have loved to have known that and there is one mini game that gave me a lot of trouble which was the balancing one where you had to balance a bunch of apes balancing between left or right depending on where you're at aside from this the rest of the trophies and game are self-explanatory there shouldn't be any issues last stop is a narrative game that tells three stories and by the end it sort of connects but all pretty much stand on their own all three stories are connected through these portals or sort of alien world which i didn't like because eventually it didn't really mean much all of the characters that we hang around with they just sort of meet they get captured they escape the alien world for like breaking the law that's pretty much it maybe get some insight from each other but it really didn't do much and so that entire part of them meeting i really could have done without that each individual story for me was really interesting 
Thanksgiving, Stranger Danger tells the story of Donna and her friends who decide to be very noisy around a stranger who brings in people but then doesn't bring them back out. Once they meet him and go inside of his things and whatnot, he finds out they knock him out and then each of them sort of watch over him. Meanwhile, Donna's relationship with her family, her mom, her sister, isn't all too great. They always seem to be butting heads at each other and whatnot, which plays a huge part in her story where one by one, her sister's girlfriend, her sister, and her mom all somehow disappear and it's because of this stranger who is wiping memories away from not only Donna but from others as well. The entire time I did not trust him because he didn't seem human. At the end of each story I was given a choice on how each character's ending would end and for Donna I chose to be alone because the stranger wiping out her memories and her family kind of worked in her favor because it wasn't like she was close to her family at all. Right from the get-go it was like I'd rather hang out with my friends rather than my family and so I thought she was better off being alone even though she pretty much got all her family killed. Domestic Affairs is about Mina and how she's having an affair. She also has a son and so she's been you know going out at night sleeping with his other dude who also has a daughter as well which she doesn't like him at all and she knows about her ring and everything like that and after deciding to get away from this guy there are notes on her door saying that they know what she's done. Meanwhile her dad is getting into drugs which adds on to the stress. There's this other person taking her position and so all of these things are just kind of coming at her. She worked for the group that was trying to save Samantha going to this other portal into another world after trying to go get Samantha and Samantha's all right. Mina's boss Peter was there at the beginning of the game with Samantha meeting that old ass dude and then it turns out that Peter was the one putting the notes on her door and knowing everything knowing the affair and in the end I had to choose either to quit and take the fall for all the murderers or just keep everything normal just sort of continue her job or work for Peter. I chose to quit and take the blame because she was having thoughts about sort of leaving her family already having the affair she even asks her dad like hey how did you and mom stay around for so long and so that's why i chose to quit and take all the blame for the murders paper dolls is my favorite because it's pretty much a freaky friday with john a dad who's very much tired of his life right now he's trying to be there for his daughter but can't keep up with his old body and then jack who's sort of the neighbor who always has their mail sent to john and his daughter and after a running with the old man they switch bodies and this sort of works out for john because now he can keep up with his daughter while Jack inside John's body is freaking the hell out. He has an old body, doesn't know about all the health issues. And so it seems that John got sort of the better deal. He had the second chance to become a great father to his daughter while Jack just had to suffer essentially. I also love that the daughter is just like okay with it. After explaining to her, she's like, okay, yeah, the shopkeeper forgot his name, but John goes to him and it turns out that his brother is the old ass man. And so after going to the world, meeting the other characters, I was given a choice to either stay in the body or switch. I chose to switch because it's just kind of messed up for Jack to be like stuck in his old body. He was in a hospital and he has a girl so John just pretended to be like hey uh, you know I have this new girlfriend even though I don't really know her and it wasn't the one that was very depressing or dire. Donna was in a very sticky situation trying to figure out what to do with the stranger. Mina was having an affair and so this one while it had moments of like oh god this is not good. For the most part it was uplifting and super happy and so I wanted the ending to be a very very happy ending for both characters. All four Life is Strange games were available to play and I've always heard of this series but never really got into it and so after playing episode one of the first one I realized that this isn't for me. This series feels more towards like younger audiences. The only reason why I got through all four games was because they were easy. The first game follows Max who has the power to rewind time. The entire story is trying to prevent Chloe's death, her best friend or former best friend because she left her in Arcadia Bay for a good amount of years. She came back sort of saw her change. She's not in school. She likes rebelling against the school, sort of all the adults, and especially her stepfather. Meanwhile, Max knows that there's this big storm coming that's going to take out the area, and there's also a serial killer on the loose. And so you got these three things, saving Chloe, the storm, and the killer, all sort of on Max's shoulders. The killer turned out to be Jefferson, the teacher, who I did not suspect at all, which is good on the game's part because Chloe's stepfather, he was a huge red herring, and just at any point, he was bullying that woman 
one girl who committed suicide, which I wasn't able to save her. And they get that he's trying to protect Chloe, but him putting cameras in the house, super suspicious, just creepy. So all of the signs are sort of pointing at him. Jefferson likes taking pictures of young girls before and sort of after they're dead and then dropping their bodies wherever he can. And so Max uses her powers to save herself and save Chloe and save others that got killed by him. But for some reason, the storm is still coming. Essentially, it comes down to either saving Chloe or Arcadia Bay because if she decides to save Chloe, then Arcadia goes away. But if she saves Arcadia Bay, then Chloe has to die. She has to choose who lives and who dies. And I chose Arcadia Bay. One life over thousands of lives or hundreds is not really worth it. And so Chloe had to be sacrificed Life is Strange 2 follows a completely new set of characters, which I do appreciate on one hand because since it is an anthology series, I'm not going to get more to follow the same characters. However, no more of the time stuff in the first game. In this one, it follows two brothers, Sean and Daniel, and the younger brother, Daniel, has telekinetic powers. And so my major issue with this game is that it could have been all avoided. Sean and Daniel just sort of stood there when the cops came. Even though it looks really bad, their father got killed, they accidentally killed the other kid. The journey of going to the forest, meeting other peoples, working for other people for marijuana, all that stuff just could have not been a thing. And so it sort of felt like a waste of time for me. Sean could have taken the blame. Daniel could, you know, just live with his grandparents and whatnot. They're just prolonging the inevitable. At least they get to meet their mother, which was nice. Just reuniting with them, which I don't know why they didn't stay there. They're in like an open land. Just could have stayed there. But Sean really wants Daniel and him to go to Mexico. Once I was at the borders, I chose to drive to Mexico, which caused Daniel to go out so that Sean can go live his free life while Daniel sort of takes the blame. He has an ankle watch on his ankle so that he could be monitored. Sean sends postcards to Daniel and both seem to be very happy. Sean is happy with his girl. Daniel is living with his grandparents. Sure he's being watched and whatnot but he's not constantly on the run having to hide his powers which I always chose for him to hide but by the end both would be fine. Life is strange before the storm decides to go back to Chloe three years before the first game and tell her story of how she met Rachel and how she was still in school and whatnot. This one was just boring. The collectibles and this one was just drawing graffitis. The first one had taking photos and the second one was just finding objects and whatnot throughout the different areas. And then since there's no powers involved, this talk mechanic or talk dialogue thing where you have to like beat dialogue for various characters to get past something or whatever, that was sort of not great or just something I I didn't care about. I was a lot nicer to the stepdad because all he wants to do is protect Chloe even though Chloe doesn't really want it. It doesn't matter. He still wants to protect her and so he's a good guy. Rachel wants to meet her mom Sarah but her father James doesn't want it to happen because Sarah is she's sort of a drug addict and sort of not in the best shape and so rather than I don't know letting things be James doesn't want his own daughter meeting her biological mother and so pays someone to kill her because he really wants his picture perfect family to say the Way that it is is messed up but also just kind of real dumb because he's that controlling of a person that he's willing to resort to murder just to keep his perfect family quote unquote and her mother while not the best person she's not out here trying to kill people and whatnot and tells chloe to keep the secret which i did it didn't matter it was a prequel rachel and chloe were gonna be there for the first game until rachel got killed and then the most recent game, Life is Strange True Colors, follows Alex Chen, who can sense emotions. Sensing memories is the collectibles, but her reuniting with Gabe and then seeing him die causes all of this childhood trauma to come back to her. While also trying to solve this whole mining disaster, she finds out that Jed was the one who caused the entire mining disaster, which killed a lot of people, including her brother and her father as well, and forcing him to admit the entire mining disaster, getting past her trauma, which seeing her parents argue not a great thing of her as a kid. Put her in a foster home. Meeting her brother again was a sort of, you know, good moment, but that wouldn't last long. To get in past all of this trauma, she now has a choice to move on from all of this and sort of go out and be a musician or stay in this town and sort of be reminded her brother was still here, wish she would have gotten to spend more time with him. But I chose leaving because if she's gonna move on, she needs to actually just move on. So just go to a new place, experience life, the Lego movie video game isn't my first Lego game. I remember going to Best Buy with my dad and seeing this box set of Lego Batman 2 for the DS with a pop figurine. It was the dark or light blue Batman which I chose to get and the only reason I wanted that was because of the pop figurine. I didn't touch the DS game until like a month later and I had fun with it collecting a bunch of Legos, getting collectibles, playing DC characters. It was really fun and it's sort of the same with the Lego movie where I had to collect a bunch of Legos. There's 
collectibles that I miss where I just looked up video guides on it. So it's not too demanding of a platinum trophy. And it does sort of want to make me go and play the other Lego games and platinum them. Because to me, they're just kind of like mindless games. I don't really have to think about them. Just playing each of the levels and collecting Legos. I wish I had more to say about Control. Because I was so close to getting to number 100, I sort of rushed this game, skipped most of the cutscenes, just sort of enjoyed the gameplay for it, which is a lot of fun. Different ways of shooting your pistol and just throwing objects levitating. The ties to Alan Wake was pretty cool though. The fact that this is pretty much a semi-sequel to that game is really cool. Most of my kills came from throwing stuff at people, whether it was the wall or like the panels. I just preferred throwing stuff at enemies because I thought it was way more fun that way. And I also accidentally went into a DLC section because the ultimate edition was free with ps plus i didn't know that there's certain sections where it's only dlc and so i got one dlc and then i was like oh wait a minute this is not a part of the main game i do want to go back to it but like with most of these games i sort of just move on and so maybe when i have all of the games that i wanted to play in platinum then i may go back to playing this game so at this point, I knew that my 99th Platinum was going to be on the Vita. And so I thought I might as well use the Vita rather than having it collect dust and whatnot. And so 95 through 98 were all from the Vita and also shovelware games. There's a good amount of games on the Vita store that only cost a dollar. And I chose four games that would only take anywhere from 30 minutes to maybe an hour. Energy Cycle was a puzzle game, which meant I looked up a video guy for it and got the Platinum. Energy Cycle Edge is, I guess, the sequel to it. Another puzzle game, which meant looking up a video guide and doing the same thing on the screen and getting the platinum. Planet Rix 13 is a horror 2D game where you're playing as a space dude or a guy in a space sort of outfit looking for a way to get out. There's a bunch of trophies tied to die in various ways, which for some I didn't even know was a thing, and so I had to look up on how to die various ways. Two different endings of getting on the ship and actually getting out, or befriending the creature or monster that's inside this building. But overall, it did nothing for for me the story it was trying to tell and just pretty much everything about it was just okay and then the last one was my name is mail this is a well-known very easy shovel working where all i had to do is constantly press x and that is all i did for about an hour changing various costumes while pressing x got some other trophies but yeah just press x Telltale's The Walking Dead was the 99th game that I wanted after getting all of those Vita Platinums. I watched a bunch of playthroughs of this game because I didn't have money back in 2012. And the only way to experience it was watching others play and what choices they made. I remember the game feeling like it was a big deal at that time and maybe it was just me. But based on one YouTube search, there's a full game walkthrough, playthroughs of it back in 2012 and even people that are new to the series. So this game pretty much is what made Telltale a well-known name and developer. The story is about Lee and how he he was given a second chance due to the zombie apocalypse and meets a girl named Clementine and I had to help her how to navigate in a world filled with zombies. Along the way they meet some interesting people. Hey, get up. <sighs> what an itchy. Well, you slept in a barn, little lady. Lucky you don't have spiders in your hair. But I bet your daddy scared him all away. Huh? Kenny is one of the first people that you'll meet and he's a good dude that's willing to protect his family by any means necessary, which would decide on how our relationship would go with him. Katja is his wife and Kenny Jr. or as they like to call him, Duck, because he isn't the brightest person in the world, but he needs them to keep his humanity. If Kenny were ever to lose them, then there'd be no reason to keep on living. Later on in the game, Duck gets bit and of course Kenny doesn't want to believe it and wants to find some other way out of it, but it can't be a avoided. He needs to accept that he's dead and I didn't want to see either Kenny or Katra kill their own son. So at any chance, I chose myself to shoot him. But Katra decides that she's going to be the one and rather than going with it, she kills herself, leaving Kenny with the burden to kill Doug and leave him alone. By this point, the only thing that kept him alive is finding the boat and getting out of Macon. But you can tell he's just getting by. He's not patient with anyone, blames Ben for getting his family killed. Kenny was the type of person to sort of talk big, but then when it came time to actually doing things, he couldn't really back it up and it's sort of karma coming back to bite him in the ass because during chapter 2 I chose to save Larry when everyone was being locked up and he was waking up and breathing but Kenny went for the kill in fear of Larry turning. While he made the wrong call he was still a good person and the apocalypse tested to see whether or not he would break or not and in the end with nothing else to lose he sacrifices himself to save Ben from a bunch of walkers and as a way to sort of say sorry or atone for just constantly yelling at him and so Kenny goes out sort of being a hero. I might not have agreed with everything he did but all he was doing was trying to protect his family be dangerous worse they could have let him right to us 
Where the hell is your humanity? They would have died out there. Then we left. Larry and Lily are a father-daughter duo who right from the start are not likable. They love fighting first and then asking questions later. Larry was straight up with Lee and says that he knows who Lee was and doesn't think that he'll change. So trying to reason with him was out of the question. But despite this, I still chose to save him because Lily losing her father would put her over the edge. But Kenny had to get involved. I'm much more empathetic towards Lily because she really is trying to keep the group and herself together. Having her father around was sort of the only sane thing that she had and once he was gone, she sort of lost that after each incident at the motel and then it all comes to a head when the group is forced to leave the motel because of bandits and Lily suspects one of them were giving some food for info and she turned out to be right and in the middle of all of this Carly points out that Lily needs to back off says a few words that don't make Lily happy and Lily shoots while I still feel sort of sorry for her I couldn't have her come back to the group because she was now dangerous to them so she was on her own you're a pretty good shot well, you don't fuck with a reporter, especially one that's three days out from her last cup of coffee. Carly and Doug, I'll talk about them as one because you get to choose who lives and I went with Carly because she was a reporter and was upfront with Lee's past but wasn't gonna put him on blast. Doug was just sort of there and Carly had the handgun, so I saw her as being more useful to the group. She's also the one to bring up telling everyone in the group about his past, which I told the truth because if I was gonna be with this group, why lie to them? And it would have probably backfired if it was a secret to most of them. I also told the truth about Clementine as well. Whenever someone asked if she was my daughter or if I knew her, I told the truth that I found her because I saw no benefit from lying. Even getting bit, I told everyone. And Carly had a thing with Lee and saw that he's changed. He wasn't the man that murdered his wife and the man that slept with her. But this was cut short due to Lily. Now, what the fuck's the problem? He's the one giving the bandit supplies. What? Ben was basically useless for most of the time. He did not want to kill, doesn't know how to use any weapons, lost where Clementine went, and was the one communicating with the bandits for info on his friends. But despite all of this, I still kept them around because having more people around is just better. They're still sort of like, kind of feel bad. I'll just have them along. At the tower, Kenny implies to just leave him, but I saved him. He's still a kid because he was in high school, but old enough to know what's right and wrong. And it seems that every time he's given a chance to stand up, he makes the wrong choice and leaves people dead and all of his choices come back when everyone's jumping across the roof and the ledge was loose and he falls being impaled in his torso and there's no helping him kenny stays for a sacrifice he stood up to kenny at one point to stop his yelling and doesn't know whether or not his family or friends are still alive and is forced to just kind of go along with this group for survival what reasons you had for doing it no reason to go and tell my girl she's gonna end up dead go she is Chuck you meet at the train and he seems chill about everything. It looks like he was already homeless when the apocalypse started so he sort of has this carefree attitude and he's the one to sort of put in Lee's mind that one day he's not going to be there for Clementine so why not have her make the hard choices, teach her how to use a gun and whatnot and maybe teach her that life before the apocalypse isn't going to be a thing anymore. Even though I was trying to keep that throughout this entire game it's sort of like why? It seems that military isn't going to come help governments pretty much done. The world that everyone knew that is pretty much gonna be long gone. Chuck isn't around for too long because when the clock towers go off he fends off some zombies and elites underground where Lee finds him. Just another person who came and went. Hey, going somewhere? You meet Molly at Crawford and she tells the story of how Crawford came to be. They get rid of all the extra fat, meaning kids or anyone that wasn't useful will be killed. Molly knows her way around the area and is able to adapt well in the new world. She almost kills Lee but Clementine prevents it because it's been so long since she saw a kid. Through videotapes, she went through a lot of trouble to get medicine for her sister but the doctor is fearful of his life due to Crawford rules and that's why she hits that zombie doctor a bit more aggressively just for payback. She leaves the group as she works better alone but I would have preferred if she stayed because she's super helpful in the group. There are other survivors from the town who seem like trustworthy people because they're in need of help but it shows that you can't really trust anyone aside from yourself and the group that you're with because they steal the boat that Kenny wanted for so long. Dude, I'm Omid. Lee. Krista. 
wants to deal with the train. Krista and Omid seem to be the most normal out of all the survivors you meet. You meet them when you're trying to find a way to move the gas tank truck. Omid is still an optimistic person despite knowing what's going on. When his leg gets hurt and seems to be waking up as a zombie, he wakes up as if nothing was wrong and doesn't have everyone worried about him. Krista is the one who's watching his back. She knows that he's gonna get himself killed one day due to his optimism, but that is why she also stayed with him, which means she also doesn't want to lose that as well. No matter how bad it looks, Omid is the one person to make everything better. She wants to keep him close by and she's also pregnant. She doesn't want to be alone when she's giving birth. Both have each other in what is most likely a very lonely time for a lot of people. Do you know who I am? No, I don't know anything about you. And then the final chapter. Clementine goes missing because someone has been talking to her with the walkie talkies and it turns out to be the guy whose stuff we stole from the end of chapter 2. It fell flat for me because I completely forgot about this. I chose not to take things from the car and this guy somehow tracked the group this entire time. He lost his family and wants to replace it with Clementine while also getting revenge on Lee. At this point in the story, I didn't care about what this guy had to say. I wanted to get past him, which is what I did. And at the end of the game, still hits really hard hard. Clementine went along with Lee to find her parents and she finds them as zombies. Despite being bitten, Lee spent his last moments helping her. He had seen Lee as her new guardian and helped her navigate through the world as best as he could and now it's time to be on her own. Taught her how to shoot, didn't steal from the car, always told the truth, prevented her from eating human meat which chapter 2 is my favorite chapter because there are still people out there who are willing to use others for their own personal gain despite there being an apocalypse. This second chance showed Lee that he was a good person and was able to guide Clementine to be a better person despite how bad the world is right now. She shoots him and is now on her own, but sees two people in the far distant, probably Krista and Omid, who promised Lee to take care of her. This is still a great game, and while I haven't played every single Telltale game, this one is probably one of their best ones. Getting to see how the zombie apocalypse affects others and how to get through a horrible situation while also showing that there's still some humanity left. So when it came to what would be the 100th Platinum, I had two games that came to mind because they were games that were endings to their franchises, and I decided with this one. Gotham's relying on one man to save us all. Batman Arkham Knight. Now did I plan on starting with Arkham Asylum and then ending it with Arkham Knight? Hell no. It just so happened to work out that way. Arkham Knight with all the DLCs was on sale for like $6 so I bought it and plan on playing it later but when it came to what the 100th game would be Arkham Knight was a perfect game to end on as it's the game to end Batman in the Arkham series. This is one of the few games that I will go for all the DLC trophies because of the special occasion. So where do I begin? I guess I'll start with the delayed trophies. There were some trophies that took a bit to pop up. Drifting 3 minutes with the Batmobile, Point of Impact, Flying Under 3 of the Bridges, Certain Side Missions, and even beating Scarecrow and New Game Plus all took probably about a good minute before popping up. I don't know whether this is a known issue or maybe it was my internet or I didn't have the updated version of the game. There are 14 side missions. The first four that I'm going to talk about pretty much serve the same purpose, which is to get more Wayne tech points. The militia checkpoints, watchtowers, APCs, and bombs are all okay. The one with the bombs are different because it was originally an Arkham Knight side missions led by him, but after a reveal, it changed to Deathstroke, which felt shoehorn in as the boss fight. If you're going to have Deathstroke in this game, at least let him have his own side mission throughout the entire game and not just at the end. And the fight isn't a hand hand combat it's a tank battle which is disappointing and it's not because of the batmobile i don't mind it it's deathstroke i would have preferred an actual fight the line of duty wanted me to save all the firefighters throughout gotham really simple nothing else to it hallelujah 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 the wicked demon has been slain join me children and let us rejoice in his eternal damnation Lamb to the Slaughter came in so late into the game that I didn't care about it. Deacon Blackfire kidnaps Jack Ryder because Ryder was snooping around when he shouldn't have and got caught. Deacon has a cult and I beat all of them up and sent him into the cells. Sort of felt like they needed one more side mission and just threw this one in here. Can't argue with the coin, Batman. 
Two-Face takes advantage of people leaving Gotham and decides to rob banks. The best part was being able to knock out Smash people without any consequences due to the alarm going off. It was always satisfying knocking them out and sort of wishing it was allowed for the entire time. But Two-Face notices that his people are missing and then it turns into a normal predator challenge map. Eventually caught up to him and took him out. I do like the Batmobile while it rides criminals that are in the backseat. Some start mouthing off and some even threaten Batman even though they're going straight into a cell. So that was a fun thing to have while driving to GCPD. Well, would you look at that? A new stuffed head for more cigar room. Someone get me a hacksaw. <laughs> the pink one has a weapons trade operation going on, and this was an opportunity to have some double takedown action. There are certain points in the game, or like with this mission, where Batman teams up with someone and there's a gauge for a double takeout, and it's the best thing ever. This sort of replaces the Catwoman episodes from Arkham City. Rather than having sections or episodes, have Bat members tag along when it's appropriate, just like with Two-Face caught up with them and destroyed his weapons. There'll be nothing but a charred stump when I'm finished with you, Batman. Firefly does what he does best and burns things and buildings down. This is like the APC missions, but Firefly is better because I don't have to deal with cars trying to bump into me and then having to look where the APC went. Firefly leaves fire behind trying to hurt you, which meant I needed to eject at the right moment to take out his wings from ever flying again. Azrael is back and is still watching Batman, but now Batman has to test it by not getting hit a single time in combat, which was easy enough. It ultimately came down to me on whether to kill Batman because of what he was told from his group or don't kill him and start making his own choices. Alfred looked into him and it turns out he was brainwashed at a very young age and this group wants Batman dead probably because he's a threat to whatever they have planned. I went with not killing because it was way more interesting for Azrael to question why he was asked to do this rather than just being another villain. Just just because he was told to be one. Everything you are, everything you have, it's mine, Bruce. All mine. Hush is back as Bruce Wayne and trusts a login to Bruce's computer, but doesn't go as planned and uses Lucius Fox for a login. Batman comes in and Hush wants Bruce Wayne and Batman decides to reveal his identity to Hush or Thomas Elliot. Thomas can no longer use Bruce against them anymore and realizes that he might have been an idiot for not figuring out that Bruce and Batman were the same. But within this time, it allows Bruce to throw him up and slam him on the table. I could see this being disappointing to a lot of people and I thought it was alright because what else do you do? With Hush. As far as I know within the Arkham series, he was just a surgeon and had others drop bodies for him. I don't think it was ever said he was a fighter or trained assassin, so I wasn't expecting to fight for a final showdown. Thomas is pretty much a psychopath, got his parents killed, and needs any reason to go after Bruce and his money. It just sort of fell flat after setting up the amazing ending that was in Arkham City to have him just kind of be slammed with one move and revealing the identity. There could have been some more things in here, maybe not an entire fight, but just, I don't know, maybe I don't know, just something else that wasn't just okay. Man Bat is just a tragic story. Dr. Kirk Langstorm and his wife wanted to find a way to cure deafness and thought combining the DNA of a bat and human would make the cure but it turned out to be a mistake. Kirk turns into a bat and murders his wife and it was up to me to find a cure for him. Kirk was told of the horrible news but the cure didn't work and he gets out after completing the mission and has to live life out as a man bat. All of this came from a good place but it turned into a real big tragedy. Pig happy pig glad pig gets to play with flesh make it look pretty after death <laughs> Professor Pig was the best one because it subverted my expectations. Professor Pig doesn't sound like a very scary or threatening villain at all, but Rocksteady managed to have him be a creepy serial killer who has the need to make the perfect body or everyone perfect by putting a pearl or most objects that don't belong in the human body. Finding six bodies with various different objects and tissue scars on all of them leads to him still working on a body and rather than normally knocking out his perfect creations, I had to ground take down all of them. What I thought was going to be a goofy character, which he still is, turned out to be a very memorable part of the game. I did it! I actually did it! I mean, of course I did. Good. As expected. 
And then the Riddler was the last one because of all the riddles and trophies. I got all of them, but it was a lot easier because there's only 243. Arkham City had 440, so I appreciate that a lot. The only one that gave me trouble was the one near Riddler's hideout. I had to save the missiles on the Batmobile in order to use all of them on the last part where all the question marks appear and then shooting the rest normally. Riddler has Catwoman on the leash because she was caught stealing for him and now has to live with nine lives. I had to find keys to free her from her collar and by solving puzzles that also included Catwoman in them. Most of these puzzles I looked up a video guide on. I did not want to spend a lot of time on these at all. And then there are some that include the racing tracks. Somehow the Riddler set up this racetrack for Batman to race with his Batmobile. And so after all of this, the Riddler comes out in a robot or sort of a mech suit to fight both Catwoman and Batman. Fighting him was fun because it's a tag team battle which includes double takedowns. Once again, this had a ton of time put into it and like in Arkham City, was good. Time to talk about the DLC trophies. There are 45 trophies which can pretty much be another game with a platinum. So I'll start with the Batmobiles and the Batmobile as a whole. I liked it even though I still prefer gliding throughout Gotham which is even better in this game. Driving around in the Batmobile was another fun way of getting through Gotham. Chasing after some people to reveal Riddler's secrets was always fun to hear them freak out. There are AR challenges tied to all the Batmobiles which are the 60s TV series, 89 Keaton, 08 Dark Knight, OG Arkham, and BVS Batmobiles. For some reason, the 60s, 89, and 08 ones only require 33 stars while the OG Arkham and BVS ones only require 21 stars. Either way, it made getting these go by a lot quicker. I only played the same races that only needed one lap and got three stars on all of them and luckily I didn't need to play every single race. There were enough of them that I could get two or one stars for some of the races but it did get repetitive over time playing the same races over and over again. These scarecrow missions are also tied to the Batmobile and AR stuff and I got this trophy when I was playing the story. Didn't care to go for three stars because it only required me to beat all three levels. There's even more AR challenges to do because of the hero and rogue challenges. I thought I was done with combat and predator challenge maps from Arkham City and Asylum but nope they're back in this. Luckily I didn't need 3 stars on all of the maps and I didn't need to play any predator maps which is what makes this game the easiest to platinum. I don't have to look up a video guide on what to do on a specific guard on a certain map. I could just get a high score on the combat maps and get 21 stars for Robin, Nightwing, Batgirl, Catwoman, Azrael, Red Hood and Harley Quinn only playing the combat maps. The community challenge pack has two of the hardest trophies, Rec Room for Killer and the Curtain Falls. I needed to defeat Killer Croc in the Iceberg Lounge but the only way to get him to fight is to get at least a million score which meant being perfect and not getting hit a single time. After failing a good amount of times, the only effective way of doing it was to start punching for a combo of 5 and then jump over, then punch, and then repeat. Get rid of any weapons like shields or the electric ones because they're just annoying to worry about. There is another option which is to be the best at this game at flawless free flow when i was looking up how others did this there was one video in which this person was the best at this game and flawlessly free flowed the entire thing but the jump and then punch method works croc comes out and that's when nightwing joins and it was easy from there because it was like the fight from his side mission and then the curtain falls wanted me to flawless free flow every round on the theater map with Batman, Nightwing, Robin, and Catwoman. This one was harder because I was trying to rush it. If I saw that there was a few enemies left, I would let my guard down and then get hit. Having to restart the entire thing again, the issue wasn't the game, it was me. I wasn't patient enough and would think I got this round only to be absolutely dead wrong. The flawless free flow bonus has to appear when it shows the numbers. If it doesn't, then something went wrong, which means you're going to have to restart. There were also story packs and honestly I would have preferred if more time was spent on these because most are maybe an hour or 30 minutes rather than AR challenges. Why not add more to do with the story packs? Harley's story is just saving Ivy. Along the way I beat up some guards and her combat is fun when the mayhem mode is activated. It's essentially a one shot move for every person that she fights. Red Hood takes down Black Mask by going through a bunch of his people. His throwing projectile was shooting his guns and it was fun ending a fight or combo by just shooting the last guy. And there's clearly a trend with these where there's the main objective and there's a combat and predator room and area that you have to get through. Nightwing catches Penguin again. The only difference is that he's able to prevent his escape from GCPD. Since Batman is gone, it's Robin's turn to take care of Two-Face and he does. And then Catwoman still wants some revenge even after defeating the Riddler by destroying more of his robots and stealing some of his money. Hey sad clown. 
turn that frown around. A matter of family was clearly the only one that had time put into it. I played as Batgirl and needed to save Gordon. There were collectibles to destroy and different ways of defeating enemies. The history of the park and how it was made was the most interesting part. Edward Burke built this park for his daughter Katie and she was going to die. He wanted her to see it before she passed. Doctors were telling him that she wasn't going to make it and then he met the Joker who used him to finish building the entire park and got Katie killed of an overdose. Katie died before seeing the park and so he wanted to be with her. Joker gives him a pill to ease away the pain he feels and Edward laughs to his death. It added a really dark lore to the park. It could have been any other park but this was added just to see how messed up the Joker was by using a man at his lowest point and then obviously you beat both Joker and Harley Quinn and save Gordon. I hope you suffer Batman like I've suffered. Season of Infamy was DLC side missions that honestly should have been part of the main game. Killer Croc is in a submarine that conveniently crashes near Gotham and Croc is on the loose again and I had to fight him along with Nightwing. I will avenge you Batman. You would do the same for me. Mr. Freeze once again is trying to save Nora and I thought really this again for his side mission but by the end it turned into a heartfelt story of letting go. Nora doesn't want Victor dying or turning into a monster just because of her. She wants him to let go and spend her final moments with her just letting her go, letting her die because it's better that way rather than trying to freeze the entire world or building a complete cryo cell or cage. Victor has to let go. Batman. Why? <laughs> well, you found him. <laughs> Victim three. You're homicidal, just like me. Look back on this and you will find how madness lurks in every mind. Mad Hatter is back and he of course has to mess with their mind by going back to Arkham Asylum in the form of the Alice in Wonderland book. The guards even looked the same as they were in Asylum. It was visually pleasing to go through some pages and then getting back to Hatter just to lock him up rather than having multiple people with bunny masks or whatever. How about messing with all of his mind but it doesn't work. I gave you a chance Bruce. A mistake. And the last one involves the League of Assassins. They're running around Gotham because there might be a Lazarus Pit lying around and Ra's al Ghul wants some to come back alive which causes some discourse within the group. Some of the members want him back while others want him out. Causing a civil war, the leader of the ones that want him out is Nyssa. She is tired of seeing her dad constantly come back and changing for the worse and I was in the middle of this and had to decide whether or not to keep him alive or destroy the remaining Lazarus Pit and leave him to die. I chose to let him die because Every time he comes back, he comes back more crazier and would be an issue to Batman later on. So it was a good time just to put him out of his misery, leaving Nyssa as the new person to lead the league and promising to leave their business out of Gotham. Now is this sort of killing a person? I mean, I guess it is because he chose to let him die, but it's Ra's al Ghul, man. He just needs to go. And that was all of the side missions, including the DLC. Overall, the side missions were good. There were some that I didn't care about, like the militia stuff and the watchtowers, the ones that stood out were Professor Pig, Man Bat, Riddler, Mad Hatter, and the League. And then the rest are either okay or just good. You have no idea. Do you, Bruce? And then the story. I'll start with the Arkham Knight himself. I remember there being a lot of discussions on who this guy was. A couple of names popped up. But the one that a lot of people were betting on was Jason Todd. And throughout the game, they make it super obvious that it's him. Showing how Joker beat him and other clues. And he was alright. I didn't feel anything when he revealed himself. Skirko was the main villain. And I sort of saw him as the henchman. And he was just sort of there. The tunnel chase was cool, but I don't have much to say about him. Jason coming back at the end to help defeat Skirko was nice but it was also a quick turnaround for him and I honestly could have done without him even if it fed into Batman's fears it shouldn't have been there didn't you know Dark Knight you can't fight fear Scarecrow is back and is now the main villain which I thought was great because his fights in Asylum were great and he just wants to release fear toxins and got them. Not the most interesting motive but I like Scarecrow so much that I'm willing to forgive it and he causes a few people to make sacrifices like Poison Ivy. She could have been another villain and criminal that Batman throws in a cell but she plays a vital part in getting rid of the gas. She didn't want to be part of Scarecrow's plans and when he releases his toxins it jeopardizes Ivy's plants which is why it made sense for her to come back and help out. 
out, but it required a lot of her and makes the ultimate sacrifice. She only did this for her plants. She didn't do it to help save others. She always cared about her plants. The Joker is still in this game despite being dead. Batman gets some fear toxin in him and starts seeing Joker in his head. I didn't mind this. I think there were some that didn't because they wanted the game to move on from him. But I like that after story events or some side missions, he gives his thoughts or just cracks a joke. So while I get why people didn't like him being in the game, I also just love him being there. Batman is forced to confront all of his fears. He lets down Jason Todd for letting him get caught and beaten by the Joker. And it comes back to bite him as the Arkham Knight. He sees Oracle die and thinks he's failed both her and Gordon for letting her be Batgirl. Which then caused her to be crippled by the Joker. Having to tell Gordon that she's been working with him as well. And then the biggest one being the Joker. He fears that he might become him. And the fear toxin allows Batman to deal with all of it. While Scarecrow loses in the end, he still won in terms of getting Batman's identity out. Which endangers not only him but but others that have associations with him. After doing everything, Bruce kills himself and Batman to protect the others and it cuts to Gordon narrating back on how the Batman died. Some time passes, Gordon's the mayor, Oracle and Robert are gonna get married, a couple and their kid is about to be robbed when a bat-like figure shows up and puts fear within the criminals, ending the game. There are a lot of theories on what this ending means. I think he used what he learned from Scarecrow and is now using fear as his main weapon to help Gotham while also having everyone believe that he's truly dead Dead, even though he's not. I like the ending, sort of wish that the journey was a bit better, but overall I like what Rocksteady was going for. All of Batman's fears have been building up all these years and now he has to pay the price for it by quote unquote killing himself and protect Gotham through a different way. And that was my journey on getting 100 platinum trophies. Now the question is, where do I go from here and what's next? I guess 200 platinum trophies? And I will be more picky with my games now because I don't want to play any more Peppa Pig or My Little Pony games. Just wanted to get to 100. I don't have any initial plans for platinum related videos as of now. Maybe it'll be more like whenever I feel like making a video for a specific game or doing a challenge. But that's it for me.